Mary Oliver is one of my favorite poets and one of my favorite lines by her goes thus quote everything that was broken has forgotten its brokenness stop quote I look around and I see much that is breaking and is fresh in our minds but will seem normal tomorrow and I also see so much that has been wrong for 75 years and we don't even think of it as a problem because it's part of the fabric of our lives if we are lucky enough to be well off the world outside our bubble is unseen to us there is so much shit going on around us that we have normalized there's no rule of law in this country for most people women are second class citizens our education system is broken healthcare is broken the legal system is broken we still have the wild caste system with us 3000 children still die of starvation every day a quarter of our kids are still malnourished and at this moment in time our society is being torn apart by anti muslim bigots who are destroying all that is best about india and even if we sometimes do protest some of this we get tired we get back to our lives the old abnormal becomes a new normal it is what it is that is why on this show at least i try to keep outraging keep dissenting maybe against a regime maybe against a conventional way of thinking maybe just against bad economics which is almost written into india's dna a couple of times a year i get economists together and do an episode to take stock of the economy our problems are chronic so it might seem like we keep saying the same things repackaging the same old laments but i believe it's important to do so we cannot take the injustice of this world for granted and a lot of this injustice has to do with economics bad economics kept hundreds of millions of people in india in poverty for decades longer than necessary bad economics is responsible for people slipping back into poverty today bad economics has humanitarian consequences and that's why we should never shut up about it welcome to the seen and the unseen our weekly podcast on economics politics and behavioral science please welcome your host amit varma Welcome to the scene in the unseen. My guests today are the economists Rajeshwari Sen Gupta and Shreyana Bhattacharya, both of whom have been my guests before and have recorded memorable episodes with me. I recorded an episode on the GDP with Rajeshwari, how GDP is flawed in concept and messed up in practice especially in India. Besides that powerful primer, we also did an episode where she and I and two other guests laid out our dream reforms for India. And Shreyana, well, Shreyana appeared on an episode from earlier this year called The Loneliness of the Indian and women which has since become one of the most popular episodes of the show and has struck a chord with so many people everywhere if you haven't already heard it i recommend you listen so many tiyal moments now when i heard shreyana was coming to bombay i thought it was a perfect chance to do a state of the economy kind of episode with her and rajeshwari once they both agreed i realized that we now had the most bengalis that had ever been inside my home studio they are both bong I'm half bong so that's two and a half bongs which is appropriate for this episode because I wanted it to be like an adda no structure just chill together ramble talk about this and that let it flow we ended up speaking about economics society the imposter syndrome how women manage in a male dominated profession how inflation affects women in a greater way than men the problems with academia and delhi high society and so on we answered a few questions that had been posed to us on twitter and at one point we were disturbed by the loud sound of a drill from somewhere which my brilliant editor gorav chintamani managed to hide completely but it still rattled us and i had to stop and figure out which flat it was coming from and get them to chill and so on and so forth you'll hear about that also in the episode so well i mean enjoy the conversation but before that let's take a quick commercial break do you want to read more I've put in a lot of work in recent years in building a reading habit. This means I read more books but also read more long form articles and essays. There's a world of knowledge available through the internet, but the problem we all face is how do we navigate this knowledge? How do we know what to read? How do we put the right incentives in place for us? Well, I discovered one way. A couple of friends of mine run this awesome company called CTQ Compounds which aims to help people uplevel themselves by reading more. A few months ago, I signed up for one of their programs called the daily reader every day for 6 months they sent me a long form article to read the subjects covered went from machine learning to mythology to mental models to even marmalade this helped me build a habit of reading at the end of every day i understood the world a little better so if you want to build your reading habit head on over to ctq compounds at ctqcompounds.com/unseen and check out their daily reader new batches start every month they also have a great program called future stack which helps you stay up to date with ideas 
skills and mental models that will help you stay relevant in the future. Future Stack batches start every Saturday. What's more, you get a discount of a whopping 2500 if you use the discount code UNSEEN. So hey, head on over to CTQ Compounds at ctqcompounds.com slash unseen. Don't forget the slash unseen and use the code unseen. Uplevel yourselves. Shraina and Rajeshwari, welcome to the scene and the unseen. Thank you so much, Amit. Good to be here. It's so great to be back, Amit. Yeah, and I got to tell you, Shraina, that your episode really took off. I remember after the recording, you asked me how was it, and I said it's a classic. And it is now currently the number four most downloaded episode uh, of the scene and the unseen. Wow, all of that in Delhi. <laughs> yeah so yeah that it is and uh, perhaps after the and it's very close to number three so it'll probably get there but the top four are kind of in a class of its own and everything is kind of below that so no pressure so no pressure at all yeah <laughs> <laughs> i will stay silent you don't need to be spectacular yes no pressure again <laughs> Great. So kind of want to start with uh, you, Rajeshwari, because, um, you know, these days the episode has evolved into this form where I spend a lot of time talking to people about, you know, their childhood, where they came from, the backgrounds, almost like a little oral history, as someone called it. And while you and I have done a couple of episodes before, we haven't done that part of it. And I'm thinking, OK, I know how she thinks, but I but don't, you don't know. know me. But I don't know you. And I'd like you to start by telling me about your recent holiday because just before this recording, you were telling me about this post-apocalyptic landscape you went to where you were in the middle of the sea and there was no water, which is so fascinating. So tell me about that. So so thanks, Amit. And, um, and, and let me just start by saying I have no idea why people would be interested at all in my life story. But since I'm here in the chair, I'll, I'll, I'll get talking. Um, so th- over the lo- long weekend, we just decided to, and we have been doing a lot of road trips during the lockdown since we couldn't go anywhere else. And this is the first time we started exploring Maharashtra, despite having lived in Bombay for the last seven years. So we decided that we have been almost everywhere that people usually go to. And there's one place that is left that we have been hearing a lot about. And that's Bordi and the Hanu. Um, so we decided to go there, a bunch of three families with all our kids and everything. Um, and little did we realize, of course, that Bordi and Dahanu are closer to the Gujarat border, which means it's incredibly hot. Uh, but still, we, we, we went. And um, so one of the main attractions of Bordi is the beach. So we go to the beach the, the evening of the day when we reach the place and uh, we find that there's a low tide. Now, what we know of low tide from places like Juhu Beach, etc. is that the, the water recedes a little bit and then after a point it comes back, right? Whereas on Bordi Beach, we discovered that the sea has literally retreated more than 12 to 15 kilometers, if not more. So you can't see the water at all standing on the beach. And what you see is kilometer and kilometer of what looks like mirage, Right, because there's a shimmery because of the sun, the setting sun, there's a little bit of shimmering on the surface because it's all watery mud because the sea has retreated and it's all slush and black earth kind of thing. And you can keep walking for about 10, 12 kilometers on the seabed, yet not reach the sea. And there was nobody else around, it was just us. So uh, exactly as I said, it, it really felt apocalyptic because in the sense that you feel that it's the end of the world and the sea has retreated somewhere far away and you can't reach it. And at least for me, I felt this irresistible pull that I have to keep walking towards the sea to find how far the water is. So we kept walking and, and after a point of time, I think we walked quite a bit. And it was just us in the middle of this vast seabed with no water anywhere. Uh, And the actual beach is far away. The water is somewhere else. And we're in the middle of nowhere, literally. So it was a surreal feeling. And uh, that's that, I mean, that ended up being my definition of having fun in Bodhi. Uh, But it was fascinating. I have not seen something like this ever before. And then we went back the next day to see uh, the sea has to come back at some point of time. And it did. The high tide was spectacular as well. So that, that was my long weekend, basically. No, and it's damn scary because, uh, you know, what one hears of the tsunami since the tsunami struck in 2003 is that the sea recedes a lot and then it comes back. So if I saw the sea had gone this far back, I would be too scared. I'd probably go further inland rather than towards the sea. In fact, we had to take a call when the sun was setting and we knew that the time of the high tide was approaching and we had gone really far into the seabed that we had to start walking back. And it's pitch dark. I mean, once you get pitch dark, there's no, there's nothing whatsoever. So we had to take a call that do we keep going towards in search of the water or do we just walk back? So we all decided to walk back, although for a split second, I was in two minds. Wow. It was irresistible. So have any of you guys seen Christoph Kislovsky's films? No. 
I call it you know the first great web series in a sense. He made a series of ten films for Polish uh, television in ninety one or some ninety or something like that called Decalogue, with each film being on uh, one uh, one of the ten commandments. Oh wow! And the first of those was called uh, Thou shalt have no other god than me. It was based on that commandment. And obviously, I don't even think he's necessarily a believer, but it was just interesting reinterpretations. And it's about a guy who's. you know son wants to go skating in a lake that has just gotten frozen up and he's complete scientific temperament and he does the math and everything so he figures out exactly that it is not safe today it is not safe tomorrow it is safe on wednesday because that's what the temperature will be and you can go skating and nothing will happen and all of that and not to give i mean the spoiler doesn't matter because it's just such a great film and i watch it again and again uh, his son goes out and drowns the ice breaks and then the last shot of that little short film is that while he's at the edge of the water and he's thinking about his son in the distance he sees as a homeless tramp who's lit a fire by the side of the lake ouch you know so if you, if you get the connection with yeah, thou yeah, shalt yeah. have no other god but me yeah. just tremendous and when you were speaking of doing calculations of what time the high tide will come and <laughs> i was like you fool come back come back <laughs> yeah Yeah, so so my my daughter, she's four years four years old. She was obviously scared because I mean, if it was surreal to me for her, she had never seen something like that. Shit, yeah. So she decided to stay back on the beach, and my husband was torn in between. Should I go with the wife? Should I go with this with the daughter? So I think he also went more towards the beach. But then for me, it was just I mean, you know, you just felt you just felt, I just felt like you keep walking and. Whatever happens, happens. I mean, you, at some point you just hit the sea; nothing more happens. But it's just that the time—it's just so far away. You keep walking, and then it can get dark. The high tide can come. You may not have enough time to walk back. All of those things. So it was spooky, but it was fascinating. Fabulous. And people say economists are boring people. What, what yeah. rubbish? What do you mean they are? Who they are? <laughs> who are these people who say economists are boring people? Oh, they're economists. Really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely not one of them. <laughs> What's the most adventurous thing you've done, Shreya? Have you been reckless? No, I have never been reckless. <laughs> I think I've just written my recklessness away, and now I'm leading the life of a very boring uh, urban hermit in Delhi. I actually, you know, actually listening to you, I'm realizing I, sh- I haven't done any travel recently. I've just been broadly in Delhi, and now with the book, a little bit of travel has now started to happen, which is exciting. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to a. Uh, holiday which would be nice but going back to this thing about economists being boring i mean ha yaar like have you seen the current conversations between all of us it's like we're saying the same thing to each other constantly and it's getting quite repetitive and boring so it's nice that you're discussing holidays now because i do think that there is just general fatigue and in the discourse no i i think that given that we are living in india it's always very adventurous and exciting to be an economist in india because there is always something or the other that's happening i mean being an economist in the us is damn boring because nothing <laughs> much happens there being an economist in india with one day you have a demonetization uh, one day you have a you know a lockdown that is announced with a 4 hours notice uh, to the utmost misery of most people and then one day you have like a gst which is implemented with the shoddiest possible manner there's always something or the other happening and i i just feel that it's it's difficult to almost keep pace with how things are changing and it's like last year we were thinking of the pandemic and the pandemic is receding and the economy is going to come out of it and then bang you get hit by a geopolitical russia ukraine war and then bang you have us inflation higher than in the last 40 years there's constantly something or the other happening so i think there is i mean i, I don't get bored with the discourse i think primarily because in india there is just so many shocks and so many policies gone wrong Um, but i think that's the source of my boredom which is that i think we keep saying things and then things just go wrong and i feel like now we're just stuck in this cycle of just anticipating the next thing that will potentially happen and then a bunch of us will write things and a bunch of us will say a lot and then we have a set of institutions and you're giggling now i can see you um you know we, who will ignore everything that useful that has to be said so I and then i feel so you know what yeah. i mean like my boredom is not with the with the state of the the fact that we have analysis to do although there's no data and i know we'll come to that i hope we'll come to that i really do want to come to that um but even if there were data and we're using data i think where my sense of the cyclical fatigue has come in is just the fact that we say stuff and then we all get very excited about it but i just you but know as we mentioned changes. yeah it's uh, it's this uh, it's quite I have to say it's actually quite dispiriting. I mean, I, at this stage, I sort of I feel that way. 
I'm so, curious what I mean, you think. Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I don't feel dispirited. At the same time, I wouldn't say that I feel extremely optimistic either, yeah. right? But I, I find a lot of, I take a lot of confidence from the fact that economists still have a lot of energy to keep doing what we are doing, despite the fact that yes, I mean things have happened and whatever we are saying, whatever we are prescribing, are not being implemented. But at the same time, if you take a very long arc of modern history like even just la- even for india like the like last long run, 30 all 40 kind of years thing. no even for 30 40 years in india right i mean where we were 40 years back and where we are today definitely there has been a significant amount of change and improvement and the way economists have analyzed things the way we have come up with policy prescriptions some of which has helped some of which has itself changed so i don't think yes if we take an immediate short term view that okay but crisis keeps happening and we keep saying this is a mistake and that is a mistake yeah. and nobody's listening to us right yeah. but at the same time if you look at again as I say 30-40 years people have listened and things have changed I don't know whether we have another 30-40 years looking at the way the state of the economy is right now where we don't know there's a lot of debate about what's happening to precarity in the job market uh, although I wonder about that But I I really wonder, I mean, I think we need some very serious investments and decisions right now, in fact. So I think what has happened is, I mean, the the reason why the despondency becomes bigger now is in the current dispensation, at least. Yeah. There has been an effort to keep, I mean, if I may call them experts or whatever you want to call them, Mm. right? There has been an conscious effort to keep them at bay to keep them away and to not involve them in any kind of decision making any kind of policy analysis and we have seen an exodus of people from India we have seen uh, all the other economists have just withdrawn in their own echo chambers and we are just talking to each other because nobody is interested to talk to us and that is something that I think the the authorities and the policy makers have done and they have taken this decision that we don't want to engage with them anymore but I also think that this is a wave I mean again I have a very long term view of things that I think it is a wave and over a period of time when they do realize that things are getting really, really bad and it's already happening. Yeah. At some point, you have to start engaging with the experts. You have to start engaging with the economists and understand what exactly, what are the ideas they're talking about. I mean, 1991 reforms happened and imagine the way they happened. Till 1991, nobody was really paying attention to that side of economic so to speak and then boom it happened and they had every incentive to roll back the reforms once the crisis was averted and they did not they stuck to the reforms and they sustained the energy and the momentum of the reforms and I think economists played a fairly important role then and since then I I think from 2010 onwards particularly there has been a you know sort of slow withdrawal from expertise from specialization from any kind of intellectual discourse and I'm, I'm hoping at least that that's, that's another wave and soon they will have to realize that this is not working out. I mean, if I look at just what's happening now, my sense almost is that there's almost a lot of regurgitating of the common sense analytics and ideas and tropes of economics, even amongst actually our politics or policymakers. But the impetus to take decisions. I mean, I think the 1990s, in fact, that reform story is, you know, Amit's done so many shows on this. It's a very powerful example of, well, we knew the ideas, but then it took sort of a whole set. It's an apparatus, right, that has to act and then has to implement and roll out and check whether the rollout is working in a certain direction. I'm not sure. I think looking at the current state of affairs, where that apparatus right now lies. So I I don't think, and, and to me, remember, I mean, it's not just about economics in academic academic economics. I'm thinking of the Indian Economic Service. I'm thinking of economists within the apparatus who are supposed to form this crux of a core constituency that will fight for reform within. And I think that's where I see a lot of lot more despondency, just informally what one sees when one is interacting with government agencies and just the general discourse. And so... What worries me sometimes is I almost feel that there's now currently like an incentive to live in even deeper bubbles, more energetic and energized bubbles, because it's wonderful then to be in that bubble and find like-minded people who you can talk to. But I think beyond those individual, I wouldn't even call them echo chambers because I think that's doing a disservice. I think they are bubbles of thoughts and very important thoughts. But I just don't know beyond that. I mean, you remember there was that fabulous book that came out, I'm going to say, before the pandemic. It had essays by people like Pranjul Bhandari and uh, Raghuram Rajan and Abhij- on sort of all kinds of things that you could do with the economy. Really useful suggestions and very concrete, actually. It was a very refreshing book because they really made it... 
I actually now almost wondered, you know, if you just go back to those texts and just see, well, how much of what was low hanging fruit has happened or not happened. I think we'll find very dismal results. And I don't think the reason is academic economists are not energized and enthusiastic. I think there's a whole community that's doing economics and the job of economic policy making and decision making, which lies within government, lies within local think tanks, support groups, lobbies. I think it's a very complex set of actors. And there I almost sense that there's a lot of parroting of the words and the tropes. But the conviction, perhaps, maybe conviction is a very strong word, but the zeal to sort of say, we need to do this. I don't know where that's evaporating. It's very sad. There is also the element that, at least again, in the, in the, in the last few years, the way things have evolved is that if you, if you, let's say, believe in something, an economic policy or, a, or an economic recommendation, it need not just on the merit of the economic argument, it may not be accepted as long as it doesn't echo with the sort of what I call the quote-unquote party line, right? I mean, unless you are really uh, talking in terms of what they want to hear, unless you are really saying you're sort of playing to the gallery, even if there is an economic merit to the argument, they don't want to hear it. And they're going to choose the arguments of the people who are talking uh, about stuff that they want to hear. Now, be that as it may, I think at the same time, it is very important to keep talking about the ideas and keep discussing and debating everything that we are doing. Sure. Because as I said, at some point of time, the need to pay attention to this will also be felt. I'm saying that it is easy to feel despondent because we are not heard or, I mean, we, people don't hear us. They, our voice is not being heard about. But then at the same time, I think a time will come that they will realize that this is not working and we have to do some course correction. And so what are the ideas lying out there on the table and how much of that can be adopted? So I think, I mean, for the sake of that future optimism, we just have to keep discussing and debating and not give up because if we give up, that's almost like what they want us to do. And you know, that that should not happen. So I'm just going to say I agree with both of you. And I'm, uh, you know, I, uh, Shreyana, I find your pessimism refreshing because <laughs> when we spoke in Delhi, it's like there are two different people, right? Shreyana comes to Delhi, she's someone else. She comes to yeah, Bombay, Bombay, she's someone else. Very else. Different, yes. Yeah, Bombay is very, Bombay vibe is very different. I wonder what's going on, you know. Uh, Bombay mein kya hai sa? But uh, <laughs> the... <laughs> the uh, bandstand. The ba- Bombay mein bandstand hai, mannat hai. But, uh, that should make her more optimistic though. We'll, we'll come to that. We'll, we'll, come, to we'll that. come to that. Okay. But because in, in Delhi, she was so optimistic that even I was saying optimistic things accidentally, you know, just out of politeness. But I am, of <laughs> course, deeply pessimistic. So I agree with you that at one level, it can get disheartening that TK, the rhetoric is all the same. And you mentioned that book in which all those people yeah. had those essays. The point is, those ideas were great. They were concrete, as yeah. you point out. None of them were new. Yes. We've been saying that exactly. for 20, 30 years. Exactly. Right? You've had even people like Jagdish Bhagwati and Arvind Panagari yeah. are saying the same things. Yes. And then when they get proximity to power, just completely ignoring everything they said and everything they believed in to go in a completely different direction. But that is a separate rant. At the same time, Rajeshwari, I agree with you that, uh, you know, our words may be pointless, if I may say our, it, yeah. it uh, kind of grandiose, yeah. but our words may be pointless, but it is in a sense our dharma to keep saying them. Because you never really know, like one uh, sort of interesting point Ajay Shah made with me when yeah. he was on the show, is is that he said that, look, the 91 reforms took that moment of yeah. crisis to happen, yes. But what is important is that there was an infrastructure of um, uh, people who yeah. believed in yeah. those ideas, who discussed those ideas through the mid to late yeah. 80s, which were the economists in government and all of that and he said that's not there anymore exactly so in fact Amit if I, if, I, if I may add one point here is that we are thinking of our usefulness from a policy perspective I think that's taking a bit of a narrow view of what economists in any field can do fine maybe we are no longer a part of the Delhi North Block and South Block and whatever RBI where we used to be called at one point of time for policy discussions but there is also a larger role that we have in terms of influencing minds and informing people, uh, creating knowledge and diffusing knowledge, right? So the way I look at it is, let's say you're creating knowledge, you're diffusing knowledge and you're trying to fix the world in whichever small teeny weeny bit you want to do it. Maybe the last part of it is a little bit broken because you don't have access to the real world policy making process, but you still have the responsibility of creating and diffusing knowledge and diffusing ideas and then shaping people's opinions, forming opinions. For example, what I do a lot with my students now that I'm not obviously 
be getting engaged in the policy making process i engage a lot with my students because these are 21 22 year olds and and they are curious they are hungry for knowledge and this is my opportunity to teach them something interesting to form their opinions to help them debate to provoke their thoughts and they are the future because they are going to after 10 years or so they are going to turn around and say you know what this government is doing is not right or this is right and to help them reach that opinion to help them reach that kind of a knowledge is also a very big contribution that i think economists can do and i think we should keep doing that because we will need to form uh, that opinion we will need to bring up that critical mass of people who believe in a certain thing and i think that's very important particularly now when there has been a erosion of intellectualism if i may call it no in fact i agree with you and i just say that that's why i do the show right yeah, that's why i do exactly. the show that's why yeah. we write whatever we write because the whole point is not because i'm very pessimistic i don't think there is an outcome to this that i i might even see in my own lifetime but the point is you do the right thing because it is the right thing to do absolutely you don't do it with an outcome so i can be pessimistic and still put as much of myself into the work because i think of it as playing the long game except it's a you know maybe some 15 year old girl listening to the show today exactly. can be prime I mean, minister you're creating a community yeah. right? you're creating a community and and that community may play a very important role at a time when you may not even be around no, and that's the, the contribution this this specific contribution that you have have mentioned is is really a public intellectual facet to being an economist now uh, you know we we took a bunch of questions on twitter and a couple of them and we'll come back to your personal story later we'll keep digressing in and out think of it as a, a, a funky yes. bollywood structure oh right? gosh so huh. we go in and out of mm. different I think of it as an adda mm. of two and a half bengalis oh god adda of two and a half bengalis is a great I way to put it i think my half also is you the half you're the, the half. half i'm the half i'm not i think it should be more like two Why? Are you Because you're half. half. Yeah, I don't think I. I mean, I've just been brought up too much in Punjab. But this is later. This is for later. So a couple of the questions actually hit directly at this question. Like you know, uh, Shreya, before you uh, came over lunch, Rajeshwari and I were chatting about how economists often suffer from the curse of knowledge. Yeah. That they'll know something so well that they'll assume that oh, everybody knows this. We don't need to say yeah. it. and i realize sometimes it's not the case most people really want to know they're curious about what do economists do and a couple of the questions that came in indicate that where monami at monami dg on twitter asks how has their research contributed to or influenced real change in the society right yeah. that's one thing and another question from murugesh is in which area the theory of economics has a highest accuracy or probability of success <laughs> that's another thing and there are different questions you know a couple of the lovely uh, sort of uh, skeptical uh, notes that were struck one is by varun das where he uh, paraphrased uh, george bernard shaw mm-hmm. and he said lay them end to end and see if they reach a conclusion and uh, another one you know harry truman had this famous saying i want a one handed economist exactly. because economists keep saying on one hand this on the other yep. hand that and a twitter user called up to a point asked a question would an octopus make for a good economist because it can say on the other hand seven, seven times, times. <laughs> so, <laughs> but my entirely serious question there for a lay person is ki yaar what do economists do right now one of the laments of uh, our friend yeah. ajay has been that too many economists who have studied uh, the subject and know the subject then enter this long academic circle jerk where yes. they take themselves out of the system and they have no impact at all on the real world and it is his lament that too many bright people do this and more people should stay back like him who actually try to make uh, who actually try yeah. to do things in the real world now where do you find economists you know like uh, in delhi i understand there might be places you can throw a stone and hit one but uh, not that economists should be stoned yes no but they but might be they might be stoned <laughs> for different yes, reasons yes very 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 soon <laughs> very yeah. very soon in multiple ways but so t- tell me what is the eco- uh, ecosystem for economists like where are economists what are they doing do they make a difference in the real world so um Uh, if i may go first go ahead um which is so there was a time amit when and i'm talking of let's say even pre 90s right when you think of economists or statisticians they were all in academia right you would have this uh, universities and there would be professors faculty members teaching students and doing research this was the old traditional world of economists from there we we went through liberalization privatization globalization etc and then i think the whole ecosystem of economists where they can go uh, broadened significantly 
differently. And it's no longer just limited to academic economies going to university, teaching students and writing research papers that nobody can understand. A lot of that happens as well. At the same time, for example, you have think tanks. And this started with the Planning Commission being the oldest think tank, so to speak. Uh, planning Commission. And from there on, you think of all the think tanks in Delhi, Bangalore, Bombay, Pune, it's all over the place in India and globally as well. Where these are the economists who have chosen not to enter universities. You're not essentially teaching students uh, per se, but you're doing a lot of government work. You're doing a lot of policy work, uh, which is also very valuable. Also, then there are a lot of economists who are in demand in the corporate world. So all of these big corporate banks, corporate organizations would have chief economists and other economists positions where they need to they need this economist to talk to the foreign clientele, foreign investors, domestic investors as well. And that's a good service because you are sort of convincing the investors to bring money into India. You're convincing the domestic investors to invest in a certain financial portfolio. And you're sort of helping them understand what the economy, what's the state of the economy like, right? And that's also, I think, a very important thing that they're doing. And also, for example, you would have economists in India, particularly, where there is this mix of you are an academic economist who are in a university, you're teaching students, etc. But you're also uh, involved in media writing where you want to make economics more accessible to the common man and you're writing in media on a regular basis because you you are you feel strongly about these things you think that you need to have a voice and the common man and these are newspapers or media outlets that are being accessed by uh, by educated people let's call it that way and and therefore you are no longer keeping economics restricted to only those who understand the jargon the math the numbers you're trying to make it accessible which i think is extremely important and and these are also the economists who could occasionally engage with think tanks you're occasionally engaging with the consulting world with the corporate world and then there's a you know sort of the boundaries get blurred which I find is a fascinating development that has happened in this post-liberalization world which was non-existent earlier so that economists operating in silos or economists sitting in ivory towers and completely uh, inaccessible to the common man I think that has definitely changed significantly and it's something to be quite uh, hopeful about for example um, I look at my uh, coterie of economists that I hang out with so to speak Almost nobody is an academic economist in a university, right? Everybody, either they have they are entrepreneurs who have started their own think tank uh, or they are in a corporate world who are, you know, talking to the investors and writing regularly in columns. Uh, they are writing chapters in books. They are talking to multilateral organizations. It's all over the place. So the, the contribution is no longer that one centric that either you're teaching students and sitting in ivory tower or you're sitting in a planning commission. Okay, it's a, it's a much more broad based contribution, and that's why I think that we shouldn't only think of our usefulness from a policy making perspective. Even if that one thing has gotten suppressed for the time being, there are many many other things where you could be contributing. And I guess that's what to, to answer your question. That's what economists do. Um, maybe I can come in. You know, in fact, this relates to what um, I was also talking about: the general sense of despondency. First, let's start with who is an economist, right? Like, let's just start with that. I completely disagree. I don't have a PhD in economics. I have a job. Uh, it's very much a job of a jobbing economist. I work with people at the World Bank. Many of them come from very strong, almost jobbing every day, dealing with the economy in real terms in very different ways. Some work on infrastructure, some may work on tariff pricing, some work like myself on the welfare state. So let's start with that. I think the biggest issue I take with, I think, the economist community is while I agree with Rajeshwari that there's a blurring, but I think there's a blurring as long as you have the same sort of uh, status and credentials as each other. You can speak to each other, you can almost scan your CVs and you have a sense of what that means. There are lots of economists and young students who studied economics. I go to Bhuvaneshwar, I go to like small towns in Chhattisgarh. There are kids who have studied a master's who are interested. Some of them have joined junior government services, right? So they are state cadre officers. There are lots of people who are very elegant in the way they think about using economic theory, data. They have a great facility for it. They may not have PhDs from the fanciest places or they may not be in fact interacting with a world of status, be it think tanks, corporates, so on and so forth. But they are actively using that body of knowledge in their everyday decision making. I work with some of these young men. Often they are men. Uh, that is still the nature of, I think that's the other thing. One is who is an economist? An economist is often a man. So it's really lovely that actually we're both here. Uh, so thanks Amit for that. Um, and I think the first issue we do have to sort of start to think about, and I think Amit, you and I talked about it during our last episode, which is how do you start to create a community of thinking and practice around the economy 
that may not necessarily be involved in academic production or production of research material for policy making or for essentially communicating to a future generation of students because i think that's a very different world we also talked about last time amit that the point is not to you know impact policy the point is to change the way people think and i think economic theory actually perhaps sometimes even more than data has a very strong way of helping you make sense of the world and i see that so i think the first thing i want to say is you know when you ask who what do economists do i think the first thing we need to ask is who is an economist and to me an economist is not someone who just has a phd from a certain sets of schools who studied it people who have that obviously have a very they play in a different league and i think that's a different from world but there's a whole community out there who i don't think are as vociferous and i wish they were and i'm looking to that and what makes me despondent honestly is uh when you asked what do economists do so there's the world that rajeshwari just described which is actually i do agree is is thriving uh there's a lot of investment this is being supported you start to move away and in fact there are think tanks which used to be really well supported now are struggling with fcra raising domestic funding raising foreign funding for research um and i think there's a deep crisis of that and when i'm talking about these young men they are again i hope there'll be more young women in say you know uh a small town or tier two town in a state in india which is not maharashtra or delhi um i think part of the issue is where will the financing a sustainable model of financing come from where a lot of these young men and women can be exposed to economic models of thinking which i think are really powerful and then use them in their day to day lives almost as if you know you're solving puzzles which is actually sometimes what i think is very elegant about the subject I don't think we're doing that enough. Uh I think what economists tend to do is uh, Rajeshwari I think has just summarized that really beautifully. Just from my own example day to day what is my job? My job is in fact using a lot of that theory to think about how different states in India uh design their welfare policies. Uh how is the welfare state functioning? In fact I think one of the core areas where I think economists and economists who don't necessarily again subscribe to a certain way we define economists have really impacted the real world is welfare. Uh I think Rajeshwari alluded to this so many NGOs, so many activists actually they come from the world of partial economics training and i can see how they've used those ideas a kind of affinity to evidence based decision making in their activism which has been really powerful um and i think you know we owe a lot to that and i think what we need to think very carefully carefully about as a community is how is it that we can raise support and create a parallel ecosystem which actually supports this kind of knowledge generation access to data and it doesn't ring fence it around just certain norms around what is considered sort of you know who is an economist by status but who is an economist by interest and by activity and then you know you may really be terrible at the subject like i could never finish a phd it's just not i don't have the ta- talent or the tenacity for it as i mentioned earlier i have different kinds of talents and that actually is a world amit i'm very optimistic about uh i think for me maybe that is where moving away what i will do in the future i think that is where i'm interested but if you start to look at what's happening to that world now it's institutionally heavily constrained in terms of where it will find sources of just straight up market financing to support it um you have you know i can tell you there are ies officers or state cadre officers working in different states in the country who want to be better trained they want to study more they want to learn more but the indian labasna and all the sort of you know the the institutions that teach uh theory or practice to these you know to officers they are limited in also what they are able to do and who they will include in their training programs the capacity and i think you had guests here who've talked about this before the capacity of administrative structures to offer this kind of training is also limited star economists do not go to you know small state cadre training academies to sort of train i think that's starting to change i'm very excited by some of the things i hear jpal is trying to do with their partnerships i think that's really the space where i think economists there's a, there's there's a lot of demand for economists to do stuff and i think there could be buoyancy but right now it's heavily constrained and i think to answer your question in addition to i think what rajeshri said and the question the gentleman asked about what do economists do uh, i also think economists do participate we can't walk away from the circle jerk 
that is a significant chunk of what I think a lot of economists are doing. Um, and I face it and, you know, I've seen it. It's interesting, even with the book of uh, the life of the book, I've noticed what that actually means. And I think being a bit more empathetic to the fact that there are there's a community out there that may not be participating in the circle jerk, but is very interested and is also in positions of authority and power and also in their day-to-day -day life can use this as theory data and make impactful, meaningful decisions. I think that's really critical to me. So, yeah. One thing, if I may add, Amit, is... It, it may not have come across clearly, but the one thing that I was trying to allude to is that, that there was a time when economics was considered uh, an inaccessible subject because it is traditionally very math heavy. It was more science than social science. It was very heavy in statistics. It was considered that only a handful of people who have a certain knowledge or bent of mind and access to a certain kind of training can end up studying economics. Um, and, and that limited the scope for economics. And that also, I think, gave economics a bad name down the road because, you know, there's this notion that, oh, if you're an economist, it's a very hard subject. It's a very dry thing. Or you're dealing with things that we don't even understand. At the same time, economics fundamentally at heart is a social science, right? It derives inspiration from what's happening in the society. And therefore, I think somewhere down the line, we lost that connection that economists need to be able to explain what's happening in the society and also communicate that to the society. So we went into this whole world of almost a very scientific theorizing world where you're very good in your theoretical models and you're doing a whole lot of cranking of equations and math. But ultimately, what does it all mean? in terms of intuition, in terms of the real-life social impact. And very, very few economists would then make the effort of bridging that, that gap. And I think primarily in the US, for example, where most of the economic theories come from, a, a lot of it was because economists there is all university economists with PhD, as China mentioned, publishing in journals. So that's a whole different ball game altogether. But what I, what I realized is, and I think I've mentioned in the, in the first episode with you, is that when I came back to India, I realized the world is much very very different and and much better quote unquote uh, compared to what I saw in the US because here there are economists who make the effort to reach out to the common man now be it and this has nothing to do with whether you have a PhD in economics whether you don't have a PhD in economics you have some basic training in economics you understand the world and you want to explain the world to the rest of the society and there are people who have made that effort you're writing in the media you're you're doing you know even to the extent that, that everybody listens to TV even in regional languages right you're doing TV interviews you're trying to explain what the budget means. You're trying to explain what's happening to inflation, what's happening to prices. And that is very, very important. And I think that's a very valuable service that economists, and by economists, I mean anybody who has a basic training in economics to be able to understand things a little bit better than, let's say, for example, what the common man on the street would. But they are taking that effort to explain that. And, to, and that is a world that I think has happened over the last 20, 30 years. And of course, there's a whole long way to go. We are just only scratching the surface. But to the extent that it is happening, to the extent that people, there's a critical mass of economists who are at least aware of this responsibility and they're doing it, doing that, I think that that's definitely a great thing. And in terms of funding, I think this is a constraint across all subjects, like even hard sciences, which traditionally would get more funding. Everybody's struggling to get funding over the last few years because there is this whole like constraint on intellectual pursuit or constraint on scientific pursuit uh, in terms of giving funding to universities and institutions. Can I just, I just want to, just on one thing, I don't, in fact, I think that there has been a particular squeeze put in and maybe uh, Amit also, I think part of my pessimism is coming from, I've just come back from Delhi and I've seen some very dear friends who are trying to just hold on to their organizations uh, with dear life. It's very hard right now, especially if you're going to produce independent social science research, which invariably will speak to livelihoods. Um, I see this across the board. In fact, some of the most useful economic data is coming out of NGOs that, you know, you take uh, a Jivika Bureau looking at migrants, you look at a lot of the work that's coming out of different organizations who are not even based in Delhi or Bombay. They're not interested in that game. They are all being squeezed. It's, it's, it's a very difficult time. And I think while, yes, sure, it's difficult for universities and institutions, but universities and institutions will always fight 
there'll be corporates, there'll be, you know, patrons, there'll be alumni. When I look at these organizations, which are almost trying to create their own models of economic investigation, actually, a lot of theory is ground up theory, right? It can come from here. Uh, I think they can come up with a very different way of thinking about how we theorize migration movements and labor leisure trade-offs, for example. But who will finance that work? Because what I see, and you know, maybe this comes from the fact that my first job ever was at a heavily underfunded feminist think tank where I saw my boss constantly struggling, this remarkable woman constantly struggling to just organize funds. And invariably, if you link yourself to donor financing, which is invariably what happens with think tanks, livelihoods organizations, donors are interested and I don't blame them. I understand they're interested in certain outcomes, right? Um, which always have to do with, oh, give me a survey, give me some data points. But maybe there's theory that can be built off that. There are lessons to be crystallized. And I just don't see right now, and I, I see organizations really struggling to find core institutional funding to be able to do that. And I think in that world, you will still have the dominant modes of knowledge production, particularly in the social sciences and economics is particularly politically very important because it is the economy, right? I mean, it kind of holds a set of interactions which hold tremendous power. Um and I think I see that. So so I share, I think, what Rajeshwari says that, well, things have changed and that, you know, the, it's a much more democratic space. Sure. I think there's a lot more than we can do. I often joke now that I don't want to Brahmin explain the economy to anyone. Uh, I actually now just want to hear where different theories come from. And I think there are things happening in universities we may not even know about, right? Uh, or organizations we may not know of. But what often I wonder about is where will that almost the venture capital for that come from? And in fact, this is where I think that the Indian private sector can come into play a really important role because we know these organizations are going to struggle to find foreign financing. So yeah, I think we have to think about just these very alternative models of supporting these ecosystems. And that I think I'm very excited about because I do think that there is a quorum of now young people, particularly in the private sector, who I think are thinking about some of these things, especially given where we are right now as a country. So I'll tell you the, the, the peculiar thing that happens with the funding constraint, and this I again learned after coming back here, is that there are certain fields which are fundable. Exactly. And then certain fields will not attract funding no matter what you do. And unfortunately, because I do macroeconomics, it is one of the unfundable fields, right? Nobody in, is interested. Everybody is interested in understanding GDP growth rate, but nobody is interested in funding any effort to actually understand the data collection process, right? Everybody is interested in inflation because it affects the common man, but nobody, none of the donors is in, interested in anything to do with funding monetary policy research. Everybody is interested in government debt taxation. Nobody's interested in funding research to do with the fiscal policies of the government. So I unfortunately work in a field where there is no scope to get funding from anybody, right? be it the big global multilateral organizations, be it the private sector, be it anybody. right? And I, I woke up to this reality and I realized that while I am at an institute where there is some funding coming from XYZ, but there is also a push to become more independent in terms of funding. So let's say, for example, if I want to start my own center, in macroeconomics research, I will never be able to get funding from anybody despite the fact that I want to start the center in the university. And the university itself doesn't want to do the funding. That's the whole idea of starting an autonomous center. But I won't get funding. But then what do I have to do? If I want to get funding, I'll have to change my areas of interest. I have to change my specialization. So for example, if I start working on climate change, if I start working even on any topic related to development economics, if I start working on renewable energy, right? These are the fundable fields where at least there is some scope of getting funding, consumer protection in finance. Like these are these silos where you can at least get some funding. So then you start to think that, okay, if I want to stay true to what I understand, what I have a limited training in, I'm passionate about that, then how do I get my own independent funding if I want to hire five RAs who are equally interested in these subjects and I want to pay their salary? Salaries, where will I get the money from? But then does that mean I have to now start researching in climate change, renewables, health, wherever the donors and the funders think that they are going to get high returns from, right? So that becomes the distortion in social sciences like economics, where either you 
change your field to suit the donor and the funder or you languish in this low level equilibrium where your salary is just being given by the university but that may not be enough because a lot of constraints imposed on you by the institute and you may not be having the the independence to start a center of your own where you can hire RAs etc so it's it's a it's a very very difficult world to negotiate there is no doubt about that so a few strands i want to pick up on and i'll come back to funding but first we'll kind of circle around the globe and sort of do that and one is one of my constant rants on the show is this impression people have that economics has nothing to do with the real world they don't who cares about these numbers and what is gdp anyway and this and that and by the way there were many questions on the gdp for us on twitter and i just want to tell all of them that listen you have an episode length answer on that because rajeshwari and i did a long episode on gdp which goes into all of these issues why is women's unpaid labor not counted and and so many conceptual problems with the gdp practical problems with the G- gdp and so on and so forth but my point always has been that numbers are people too that uh, you know economics matters because it shines a lens on real things going wrong in the real world to real people a, a, a good economist will always make that distinction clear like one of the reasons i loved your book shrana so much was that that's exactly what you did right you used the tools of economics the frames of economics of thinking about problems to get to in a sense the core of the human condition that this is what people are like this is why a man and a woman in the same house can't speak which is a great human tragedy but this is why it is and you're using those tools to illuminate that you know and to me that's the best of economics in the sense that it's okay i see this entire class of economists who go to college get their phd's get all of that they'll be hyper specialized in sea trade between peru and bolivia between 1830 to 1844 right <laughs> oh uh, i know who you're talking about no i'm, I'm not kidding. actually talking about anyone in <laughs> particular <laughs> <laughs> I never I never I never I don't I don't It is my tweet. job to introduce the gossip into the into we'll the come to that. Yeah. we'll come to that we'll come to that but on the other hand the thing about economics and why I, I am so much in love with it and of course I don't have a phd in it either but one reason I love economics is I feel hum- economics fundamentally is a study of human behavior right mm-hmm. so if you're interested in human behavior the economic lens can just teach you so much like earlier rajeshwari you and i were at lunch and i asked our companion to ask me any question about anything and i'll give an answer using economics and it's a one word answer and you know and you can because the economic way of thinking just illuminates the whole world now taking that forward when i think of you know the person who asked the question that what have you actually achieved now there are three ways of defining yes. achieve right one is a top down thing where a government does something are you influencing policy at this point in time for the last few years i don't think any serious economist <laughs> has influenced policy in any way obviously it's just uh, quacks and crackpots Maybe bad policy and, but sure. and useful idiots uh, yeah and that's one way but the point is if you really want to bring about change i've always said don't look at the supply end of the political marketplace look at the demand end get your ideas out there among the people you know in clear language use those tools of economics share those tools of economics so others can also apply them to their own lives and the world around you and there i think within civil society there are two ways this can happen one is civil society organizations which do their own work and their own research like you know shrana you pointed out you went to bhuvaneshwar there are all these enthusiastic mostly men who are you know doing all of what they are doing but the other is just this greater awareness among citizens of what is going wrong and i think understanding economics understanding incentives understanding scarcity all of that has a big role to play in that and therefore my question on funding is this and i think it might have come up in a different form in our episode also shrana is that in everything else i find that things like funding and support are in a sense decentralized and no longer so dependent on authorities or mainstream platforms so if i want to write a book for example sure there might be themes which are popular in the publishing world which are chasing a formula and chasing a trend but i can write what the hell i want and in the creator economy you are no longer dependent on gatekeepers and you can in fact even crowdsource whatever funding you might need for your work and increasingly you see this in more and more ways even if you don't call it crowdsourcing everyone who's successful in the creator economy you know whatever they earn through what they do they can put it into what they do next as indeed i do so is there then a possibility of you know economics escaping this circle jerk and escaping this whole game of having to influence policy to be influential because i think the greatest impact that economics can really have is that people see the world differently 
today people look around them and you know the 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 sort of economic illiteracy and the how that affects the way they look at the world uh, it, it just makes me very pessimistic but i think that's where we kind of need to work harder so just some rambling thoughts what do you guys so, think so again uh, it's not rambling but uh, i might be wrong in this but i think what happens is that say end of the day let's say you you want to earn your livelihood as an economist right you want to earn a living somebody has to pay you money right unless you have enough money that you can just sit on it and do freelance economist i mean that also many people do and that's fine but that's a very very small percentage so let's not go there so if you want to earn your living as an economist somebody has to pay you and the question is who's that somebody going to be is it very safe an university uh, a corporate a think tank an ngo a uh, uh, a decentralized local level organization there has to be somebody who pays you the money and whoever is paying you the money it's not free lunch that entity wants you to do some things in a certain way right while we say that as academics or as economists or as intellectuals we have certain freedom that freedom is also not unchecked unrestricted right now this gets significantly worse when you're talking about funding agencies yeah. because when it comes to funding agencies let's say i want to break free from the the university system right i want to break free from institutions i want to break free from think tanks everything and i just want to as i said set up my own center where i can do whatever i want talk to the common man explain economics in the common language everything that i want to do who's going to pay me the money to do that the funding agencies are not interested in that unless you are doing this in the field that they think will have policy implications right and therein comes the whole policy circle that unless the government or the powers that be are interested in this field the funding agencies have no incentive to fund that particular field which means you're back to square one then you suddenly don't have the freedom to talk about xyz in economics that you actually are passionate about but then you have to cater to what the funding agencies want you to do and what the policy makers want you to work on so i think therein lies the conundrum that we haven't reached the level of sophistication uh, of um, i don't want to use the word gdp growth but we haven't reached the sophistication of a certain level of income of the country where there is funding for any kind of discipline that a person wants to study and research in and therefore because there is a pyramidal impact there is sort of like a you know precious resources being allocated across a large number of disciplines economics sort of is on the back burner it's it's a compared to let's say the hard sciences compared to science and engineering research which attracts a lot more funding economics as a social science i mean other social sciences are worse off uh, but we are still better off on that front but even there we sort of fall on the back burner and then all of these jostling comes about that what is the field that you're interested in but no sorry there is no funding in that so therefore you can't do anything in it so it's not easy to break free from that uh, and yet sustain a livelihood i you know i've been thinking about this actually a lot uh, of late and i think there are a couple of things that i feel which are actually in the realm of again what you know the the mckinsey consultants would like low hanging fruit i think the first is we have to think of more market clearing mechanisms of matching demand for certain research grants with those who have the resources to do it domestically because right now i i think Uh, we are living in a fool's paradise if we think this whole situation with the fcra is going to it's just too complicated and i also don't understand it enough to be perfectly honest uh it's just very messy but i think there are there are enough deep pockets domestically it's just that they're financing a lot of other kinds of work uh, a lot of money is going into invisible electoral bonds it might be nice if some of that is you know uh, so i think some of it i'm looking honestly to the private sector uh, and i think i'm looking to technology platforms vcs to say can we think about a way a certain proportion of the csr funding is pooled and you create some kind of a matching platform there is no reason i'm what you described about the creator economy cannot be true for a lot of and in fact a lot of these research projects you know what rajeshri described it's not expensive it's not like you're asking for core institutional grants sometimes it, it might just be a small piece of work and there ought to be ways to just match so i think i'm this is an open challenge to anyone listening to us or anyone in the private sector who can create an aggregator platform let's try and think about creating something that does matching right that's one i think the second is there have to be i think some rules and norms in place to say that some part of the icssr if i've got the acronym right 
um and each time nowadays i mention this acronym uh, my friends in delhi at least all look very like the shoulders start to slump um i think there has to be some mechanism where you know yes of course one is despondent about reforms but institutions do change and institutions have to be updated we have to think very carefully about some of the social science research institutions what can be changed and we do currently have a government you know for good or for bad is very big on administrative reform there's a lot actually that can be done uh which will you know toe any party line which will make anyone look good so i think we need to we need to attack you know the fundamental problem which is the way the government organizes is also being a principal funder of a lot of this research uh either we say well part of the government should just get out of it that's also a possibility or we start to think very carefully about how do we in the current contemporary world that we live in organize these institutions so that's the second and i don't think that that again is so difficult it's possible to do i think the third has to be we need to think about and this i know gets a little controversial because this is where you start in introducing distortions but i really do think we need to think about financing ecosystems in smaller cities there has to be some i'm almost thinking like affirmative action for towns where we say that funding has to go to core universities in places which are really because if you look i can actually show you a map right now and i'm sure this is not going to surprise rajeshwari or you amit but funding is very geographically concentrated everything is going and and by the way it's not because researchers are often there now in fact many researchers are in you know all parts of the country but it's because the accounting ability the capacity to process the money to do the procurement all of that is actually sitting in the big cities which is why money goes there if you start to put in rules which almost create this distortion and artificial allocation maybe then we start to build you know there were these good governance centers coming out for example from madhya pradesh i'll give you that one example those organizations they've done so much for the lok seva kendras and the right to time bound services in the state of madhya pradesh this is also true for smaller towns in karnataka because they also they were doing governance research but it was finance some financing from government along with organizations coming in to support and it worked really well because now if you go to madhya pradesh there is i mean for good or for bad there is a thriving community of people who can explain the governance structures down to the bone to anyone who wants to understand which is useful for politicians is useful for what you were saying citizens knowing more about how government is organized right we need to put in these there has to be some rules and norms such that the geographical concentration of the funding pipelines have to just radically change it will make people like me very unhappy because you know people like me want funding for projects that i want to do based out of delhi but i think it's time that people like me were a bit more frustrated and others received i think more of the allocations i think that's the third last thing i should i said three things but i should have a fourth thing which is i really have been wondering a lot about if we were to measure our mps or our mlas on the measure of economic decision making i mean it's a very again this is something i've just been thinking about it's very abstract how do you start to crystallize that it can't be growth because it's not something that they control and rajeshwari will uh, get angry at me if i even try and suggest that but they have to be is it is it roads maybe not because that's done by the central ministry can we think about incubating a research group within you know one of our larger more prestigious think tanks and again this is an open challenge to anyone listening who thinks very carefully about how do we almost create this kind of evidence based citizen centric conversation around how well is my mla doing when it comes to managing the local economy how much does the lo- mla even control of the local economy how many you know what can the mp do have they made speeches in parliament on you know the way certain economic decisions are being made uh, how have they supported the gst rationalization process as the government is trying to figure out how to implement it better there have to be methods through which we can hold political officials much more accountable on the economy i think what's happened is there was a method to try and do these citizen report cards it's happened often they're very simple service delivery measures uh often we uh, you know adr has done a lot on corruption right saying how many people have cases against them but can we think very hard about 
uh, supporting and again perhaps this will require you know large trusts and donor organizations or you know the private sector to support a very thought through conversation on measuring firstly the performance of a political office when it comes to at least the local rules of the economy that they do manage because it's not like they can completely wash their hands off it there are things that do sit in their control and how do we sort of foster that conversation and i think amit this goes back to what you were saying as well which is that you know we see for example with the with the app right it was that conversation around corruption and holding mlas and local officials politically accountable for corruption that fostered an entire social and political movement why don't we have that for lemon prices you know right now we're all discussing inflation can we think about breaking it down in simple ways so that the ordinary public who is consuming this information can understand it hold their local officials more accountable anyway so this is just a list of four things and I'll yeah, stop I mean I mean a couple of you know with this last point and I'll go back to the earlier ones but a couple of um, uh, issues that I see coming up here is number one our MPs can actually do nothing they're powerless yeah. uh, partly because of the anti-defection law I've had episodes on that with Barun Mitra and Amar Madhav and I'll link them from the show notes but you can run parliament from an excel sheet MPs are not allowed to go against the party line mm-hmm. the, what the PMO decides is effectively what every BJP MP and MLA in this country is bound to so what do you hold them accountable for when you don't have the power the second issue is I've done an episode with our mutual friend long ago Shruti Raj Gopalan, who has recorded uh, with both of you in different ways and also as a question for you guys I'll bring up later but uh, which was about urban governance and her point was that at the local level there is a disconnect between power and accountability mm-hmm. that uh, the, for example the person who's uh, you know standing to be an MLA in Maharashtra or in Bombay or who you know their vote base is different uh, nobody is looking at an urban vote bank in Maharashtra. They're looking at all the different rural vote banks and all of that. Now, you might be worried about, you know, why is the garbage not being picked up from outside? But the person you can vote for does not control that. Yeah. And the person who does control that is outside your control. So there is that disconnect between power and accountability, yeah. which is also a question which greater local self-governance yeah. would, of course, help. But, you know, Amit, on that, and there is actually work in economics and in political science coming out of the US, Latin America that shows when you start start to even create noise about holding local officials accountable, it also then fosters inner party friction. Because right now what you have is one word goes because there's also not, you know, there's no incentive for an MLA or an MP now to fight that or fight against that sort of party line because they are not necessarily being fully impacted or held to account for it. And I think I see and I my sense is if we actually and this is I think this is why it's an open research question to what extent can we hold political officials accountable or is it just that there is only everyone in the Ministry of Finance and the RBI who can be held accountable for what's happening in the economy I don't think that that's true I think there is actually different levels and levers of control that are available and either you're just not exercising them in which case then people need to know and there has to be a more well thought out method to do that because right now we just don't have that conversation I mean in the US you have conversations around lobby groups right and we see that a lot we just don't see that very clearly in our country but who is you know where are we holding our political officials accountable on questions around the economy if it isn't them profiteering off the economy in corruption I mean in a different way um and that's something I I hope someone takes up and I'm not completely sort of, you know, throwing that out just because MLAs and MPs don't have control over all decisions. I think there's a way you can do it. Sorry, go ahead. So I think uh, accountability has become a, a pervasive problem now, right? I mean, I see instances, for example, I was shocked that you do something like demonetization <laughs> and you get away with it, right? And you win a large state election right after demonetization. To me, that was a shock. I mean, there was not a single protest all over the country and it was a nationwide shock um, and there was no protest. I mean, other than some small sporadic protests in Bengal, but in Bengal, there's a culture of protesting everything. But other than that, there was no protest anywhere in the country. And, and and then you saw the election results. Then you have the second wave of the COVID pandemic and we all lived through the horrors of it. And then you see the election results and you think and wonder 
what what's the connect between holding the state the government at any level accountable for what happened and who i'm going to vote vote for so this to me has become almost a puzzle that yeah. how do you enforce accountability at any level of governance when the it's very it's become very easy for the government to win elections yeah. through bread and circus by providing rations and cheap internet where everybody is going to vote on the basis of short term gains at the cost of long term pains and therefore where is the accountability for larger things like any of the economic issues you talk about right you talk about healthcare you talk about education you talk about corruption you talk about infrastructure things that we like to talk about but when you go to the common man what is he or she voting on she's voting on do i have a cooking gas connection do i have water do i have electricity do i have a house these are also important but what it has boiled down to is that the government is using its limited resources to provide basic goods and services as opposed to providing public goods and services so to speak right and therefore that accountability mechanism i am happy because i can access clean water clean cooking gas and 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 a house which for large pools of indian population that's very important so am i going to hold the government accountable for rendering 86% of the cash invalid overnight my life is miserable as it is it's a little bit marginally more miserable but at least i have access to clean gas and clean water etc right or am i going to hold so i think what is the connect of the citizen with the government does the average citizen even interact with the government on a regular basis and i don't think they do so therefore in the minds of the citizenry government is somebody who's providing maybe the basic goods and services i'm happy with it and therefore come elections for whatever compulsions i'm going to vote for such and such local uh, party member beyond that the, they are not holding the government accountable for any of the things that we think are important so i think there is a disconnect between that interaction between government on a day to day basis and a citizen's daily life and it's very easy for a government to sort of win over that interaction by providing these basic goods which is exactly what has gotten entrenched in indian polity over the last several decades so who do you hold accountable for what i mean how do you hold rbi accountable for what it's doing how do you hold ministry of finance even i'm not even going at the decentralized level at the centralized level there's no accountability at the decentralized level there's no accountability i mean think of the bengal elections i know bengal because i'm from bengal um how do you win elections you float a lot of schemes which are women centric women come out in hordes to cast votes that's a remarkable thing great but why are the women voting because most of the schemes are directed towards women is there any uh emphasis on job creation is there any emphasis on actually building infrastructure assets or anything that's going to promote long term sustainable job creation and growth no so it it's become increasingly easy for political parties to win elections which is what they most care about and in that kind of a system where you can just win elections by providing freebies and basic goods how do you hold anybody accountable you know where is the accountability can i just one I I hear what Rajeshwari is saying I disagree with the uh, you know this is now now this is my bangali lefty self the little bit of the bangali in me I'm kidding but I disagree with let's not they're not freebies because we do live in a world particularly coming out of the pandemic where most of the country is between the poverty line and twice the poverty line I mean this is a we are it's it's a really dire situation extreme poverty has reduced in india continues to reduce but precarity has just increased incredible levels we know from rcts across the globe and also work that's happening in india that you need some assurance and these transfers are very important i think what needs to happen and i know amit maybe we'll come to this later i think one of the core reforms that certainly something in my work i'm really pushing is india needs to have a social protection policy what other countries would call a social protection policy i think it links to what rajeshwari is saying which is you need to have a fiscal path on which these kinds of entitlements and programs operate so if you look at you know brazil or mexico or many of these countries you essentially have a very clear policy path which says certain x share on spending there are limits and rules there are rules of the game i think what's happened here is you have 20 pension schemes they're targeting the same person and often the person who's supposed to get it doesn't get it right there are all these issues i think there has to be a way and first you need to bind different groups of government into a policy framework right now we don't think about it like that i think some states are thinking about it like that and i i'm hoping you know in the future that this is something that the national government at least will have to think about because it's also fiscally unsustainable beyond a path having said that i think i agree with you know everything rajeshri just said but what i will say is i mean jobs for example it's just 
fascinating to me. Jobs in inflation, actually. And I'm curious to hear what Rajeshwari and you, Amit, have to say. I don't know, coming out of the UP election, I think all of us had this moment of tremendous, uh, I don't know, I don't even call it pause. I think it was just somewhat, sh- because is it the case that jobs just don't matter anymore? I was seeing some really interesting journalists reporting out of UP, essentially saying, similar to what I think Rajeshwari is saying, which is that as long as you have a a core set of entitlements. Uh, But it's interesting because I also know the data and UP to know that the people who actually are targeted for, I mean, who should be receiving priority for those entitlements don't get the full basket. Is it that that just doesn't, is it the jobs just don't politically matter? I think that's an open question. And honestly, it's something that I don't have an answer to. I know that women's jobs don't matter at all. I don't think anyone cares. Uh, I think we are very happy with equilibrium in the employment landscape when it comes to women. But I'm wondering whether jobs just have stopped mattering as a political issue. I mean, did they matter in the history of our country's economy? I wonder. I mean, this is a question for us to think about. And the same for inflation. I mean, look at what's happening right now. Now, in fact, I do see, of course, the opposition has picked up on it. But I wonder that, and I don't know if it's just, honestly, Rajeshwari, I don't know whether it's just that you've been sedated as an electorate through welfare, because actually not everyone is receiving the welfare transfers. I mean, it's not also, we saw what what happened with migrants going back during the crisis. The One Nation, One Russian card is yet to fully take off. Uh, It's not the case that everybody is receiving the entitlements. In fact, you have activists arguing for deeper entitlements because there are concerns about some people just being completely left out. So I wonder what's going on. I mean, what are you, I mean, if jobs and inflation are not political issues anymore, which all of us in our one-on-one training were told that, well, they are and they should be. I wonder what is what is the labor market now? Is the labor market basically getting paid to, I don't know, harass people online? I mean, are those the jobs that we are going to create? I, I, I wonder, is that now what the job market is? It's an open question to both of you. So I have, I have several points to make, uh, Amit, okay. if I can. So one is that I do agree that the pandemic was obviously, it's, it's an outlier rare event, right? And when a rare event like this hits a country, you need to do redistribution because uh, the situation is absolutely dire. But I think there is a case to be made that redistribution should focus more on rare events rather than become Uh, a norm. And I think what we have internalized is we have a redistributive model of development. And that is what we have internalized over the decades. And that is what gets used in election cycle uh, to basically win the elections. And that's where the accountability breaks down, right? So basically, I guess what I'm trying to say is that if the common voter is happy with the basic goods that are being provided, irrespective of a pandemic, then what is the incentive of that common voter to say that, no, I'm going to hold you accountable for all these other problems that happening in my locality right i think that incentive structure is is very weak and and that is something that has somehow smoothly happened if there's one thing that has smoothly happened in india over the decades it is this idea that you can give the common man these basic goods and services and uh, and he or she is okay with it because you're starting from such a low level that yeah. you provide that and and they need that basic yeah. standard of life and the government is providing that and then they no longer feel the necessity to hold the government accountable for all the things that we think are important in the long run right and the second thing is I think jobs were never really that important when it came to winning elections, right? Because India traditionally has had a very high unemployment rate or a very low employment rate because I don't particularly trust the official unemployment numbers. But if I just look at CMI's labor force participation rate, right? We've always had a very miserable statistic as far as jobs is concerned. So any incremental improvement on that almost feels like something great has happened. And I completely agree that women's uh, abysmally low LFPR just does not matter to anybody. That's not even an electoral agenda. Um, But basically, the fact that jobs have never really been a a decision-making point when it comes to winning elections says a lot about what is it that the people of India really care about, right? And that's where I think if you're getting uh, the welfare uh, entitlements and you're, 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 you're okay and you're, you're not holding the government responsible for not having jobs. So I think you're, you're not, the accountability is not directly being lined with the government not providing jobs. But I think what does matter is inflation. 
In fact, 2014 election was lost uh, on two counts, I think. One was corruption and one was inflation uh, because prices were, were exorbitantly high. Yeah. And inflation is like the tax on the poor people, right? And it's yeah. the worst tax on the poor people. Yeah. So when you have uncontrollable inflation that you're just not able to uh, manage, I think that definitely becomes a very deep political uh, problem. And that's what I would be very curious to see what happens yeah. in 2024 because we definitely have lost control on inflation the way it, it, the things are looking like. So I think jobs is something that the voter perhaps does not worry about as much when it comes to voting. But inflation definitely something and corruption. I think one of the reasons the government got away with demonetization was that the selling point was this is an anti-corruption measure. Yeah. And they feel so, the, the average person feels so strongly about corruption that it was easy to even get away with something like demonetization. But I think inflation will be much harder uh, to get away with and something has to be done soon. But but yeah, I, I constantly worry about accountability. I mean, in a, in a democracy, yeah. our only weapon of holding the government accountable is elections. And if that's where this whole connect has broken down, how do you hold anybody accountable? I think I'll double down on what you uh, just said and what you said earlier, because that, that, that was actually the third doubt I had about your point of making politicians more accountable through good economics. Because my cynical take there is that ultimately you hold people accountable on the basis of what you believe about them and it comes down to narratives not facts yeah. and often good economic narratives are much harder to sell for example i think we'd all agree that you should allow every eye in retail yeah. because it's good for people at large and so on and so forth i mean hardly needs to be stated but it's very easy for a politician uh, to uh, oppose it by saying what about the small traders what will happen to their livelihoods you know look at the seen effects and not the unseen effects around the line so on and so forth and those narrative battles are ones which are hard to win like in fact, i'll give you another big example amit for the longest of time uh, we were fighting with this frdi bill which is resolution of financial firms right and it's a very very important policy step to take because while we have a bankruptcy procedure when non-financial firms go bankrupt I and mean, how do you just resolve them there is absolutely nothing for financial firms for banks etc of course it's a different matter in India banks never fail but that's that doesn't mean that they're healthy I mean it's just like a you know facade that that we are all very comfortable with but but then how do you deal with failed financial firms and there was a, a, a bill that was almost tabled and all a lot of people we know the world worked on the bill, but then the FRDI bill got completely shelved because the narrative got spun in a very different way that the common man is going to lose bank deposits. The common man is going to get the raw deal because there is no insurance against deposits and what's going to happen. And immediately the whole political narrative changed and you lost the popular support and the bill got shelved. But I guess that therein lies the importance of the powers that be to realize what is important for the economy in the long run or for the country for the long run as a strategy, as opposed to just selling something that will be very popular for the voters. But you know, that's again never going to happen because, you know, public choice theory would tell you the yeah. politician is focused on the next elections. And that's our constant conundrum. But, you know, but here's the thing. So, you know, just a couple of things. So, let's take Chhattisgarh. I'm just going to keep going back to Chhattisgarh for some reason. Chhattisgarh was one of the first states after Tamil Nadu to say, well, we'll universalize the food ration program, right? And you did have uh, that particular, the Mr. Raman Singh's government. They came back to power a few times, but eventually they lost as well. And it's not for the welfare transfers were working well. There are many states, in fact, where they've universalized the welfare programs, a core set, and yet you've had churn. And so clearly there is, you know... I, I, I want us to sort of think a bit more critically because I think it's become now, I hear this amongst a lot of economists, which is, well, you know, it's sort of, it's just welfare for warts or handouts, right? It's just another word I don't like. I think there's something deeper going on. I think what's happening is it's also in relation to what's happening to other markets because if you have a job market that's always been precarious, I think part of the reason why Jobs have never really been a political agenda. And this is going back to, you know, you have a largely informal economy. Jobs are extremely ad hoc. They are human arrangements, right? What are jobs? I mean, it's it's a set of relationships. And in that world where there's always flux, I'm not surprised that people think that, well, you know, politicians can necessarily not intervene. However, what did happen was there was Narega. 
And when Narega did happen, it has completely, I mean, there are studies that show really rigorous work that shows it has radically transformed the, you know, the reservation wage for someone involved in the rural economy. And that's really important intervention. Now, I don't see again in politics, people necessarily, perhaps after a certain point, holding any politician accountable for how well Narega is functioning in a particular state. And in some states, Narega ought to function because agrarian job markets and labor markets are really breaking down. And you would think in that context, and especially in inflationary context as well, Narega is self-selection. You're supposed to demand that work. And it is a job market intervention. I mean, it's not just a welfare scheme. It's actually trying to attack the labor market. Um, And yet I don't see, it's not necessarily yet as politicized a scheme as at a point of time it used to be, right? Um, And I wonder, and I don't have an answer for this. I mean, these are just questions I have. I wonder what's going on. Maybe I think, if I may just interrupt, Go maybe ahead. because the Narega was, I mean, and, and I agree, it's a brilliant scheme and I think we should have an urban Narega as well after yes. what happened in the pandemic. But I think it's because Narega was essentially a brainchild of the previous government. And maybe that's why we don't see Narega come repeatedly and showcased as, because it is a successful strategy. And in fact, it was a savior during the yes. pandemic. But what we saw in the budget is that the government has actually reduced the allocation on Narega. Uh, and maybe that would not have happened if it was their brainchild. Yeah, but, but I'm just brain- yeah, but I think Rajeshri, actually, I do have to say, I think when it comes to welfare, there's tremendous continuity across political lines. In fact, that's one thing that's very interesting about the Indian polity. Uh, and I know that that bothers some who think about it as sort of, well, again, you know, as you were saying, like this sort of distorts clear accountability mechanisms, distorts other markets as well, right? But what's interesting to me, for example, is Narega, actually for the previous budgets, the allocations actually increased under a different political dispensation. In fact, this government has used the National Food Security Act to even open up further. So I I almost see this deepening. I, I think what's happening, though, is that while the welfare story is sort of, you know, moving along a certain path, I think the question really is... We now have a welfare system which is very broad in that there are lots of schemes. Currently, there are around 464 national programs. States have their own. A state like Kerala even has programs at the panchayat level. And yet the depth is very limited. So the actual amount that people are receiving is very small. And I suspect actually the reason why you almost have this rewarding of schemes is precisely because you don't have one large lump sum transfer. I, my sense is that if we actually thought very cohesively in a way about welfare, it would actually be beneficial for politicians as well because you could say, well, these are this is a national transfer. Maybe the state government does a top up, Narega and PDS function. And then let's think about consolidating all these other legacy programs. Um, but I just don't, again, and this is something that is good politics, it would be good economics. But I just don't see, again, the the energy to sort of move in that direction. Perhaps we'll see it. There is an election coming up soon. Maybe we'll see it. But I, I think to just go back to, I, I agree with what you said, Rajeshwari, but I also wonder, you know, I, I think the reason why welfare keeps coming up to be this important electoral almost issue is because actually the benefits are so small and you're not even guaranteed if you work on Narega. We know studies show you don't even know when you'll get your wages. Uh, there are wage backlogs for a very long period of time. And so I think, you know, there is this, so it's almost transactional because the actual depth of the benefits and what people are receiving is so unsure and insecure. So I think, Amit, going back to the question, I think the idea of holding a local politician accountable for good economic choices, it's not just sort of, you know, what can you do on broad budget, broad bills and budget bills and so on and so forth. I think it's also the local economy because there are roles. And again, this is a research question. What are the roles and levers that a local politician has to impact the local labor market? I'm thinking of Narega as one of them because they do exert tremendous influence on the way panchayats are able to administer or push them to administer certain programs. Um, I wonder if there are others as well. I suspect PM Kisan is one of them, just as an example. It's the quasi-basic income for certain groups of farmers. And I think that's where I think we should think a bit more carefully But how do we start to at least generate more evidence, which I realize then goes back to that circle of, well, we need to raise resources for that kind of work. But I think that's, I feel like that's really where, maybe we're not talking about what economists are doing, but what economists now ought to be thinking about and doing. So let's see. 
I mean, as an aside, I would say that just going back to the resources question, I think there are new ways of thinking about it, which will become more and more popular, like what Shruti does with Emergent Ventures, for example, yeah. where you just give money to someone and then you don't ask any questions. You just give it to them. And I really like that model where you identify uh, people you trust who you feel will do interesting work and then you don't ask any more questions after that you trust those people to do whatever it is they do that works i think that deeper kinds of crowdsourcing can also work over time it just doesn't have to be either the government or institutions or even uh, you know private companies uh, deciding to do this i think it can also come from a different place and as far as people you know not voting with where their interest should lie i would say a lot of that is also apathy like there's this beautiful saying uh, from kashika asi which has almost become a cliche on the show because i love it so much i keep the saying harmonia it harmonia one yeah bhar mein jaye duniya hum bajaye harmonia yeah. i think that's everyone's attitude man because nobody expects anything from any government after 70 something years of mis- misgovernance basically now i want to focus on a different question and go on a rant that might seem unrelated but in a sense is unrelated a couple of people Uh, on twitter you know where we uh, solicited questions spoke about uh, inequality right and uh, you know i had written a column which i link from the show notes pointing out that listen we inequality is a western obsession it, it's a you know it's a luxury of the elites we need to focus on poverty poverty and inequality are completely different things and the reason people conflate the two is really zero sum thinking which is something pervasive that economists have to fight all the time that you know if somebody is getting poorer somebody must be getting richer and therefore inequality and poverty they go together now that's not the case inequality and poverty often go in opposite directions like one thought experiment question i like to ask people is in which of these two countries would you rather be poor bangladesh or the usa and obviously you'd rather be poor in the usa and the usa has far more inequality than bangladesh does in fact countries like usa hong kong singapore the united kingdom have greater inequality than bangladesh liberia pakistan and sierra leone but these last four countries i name have greater poverty right now what has happened after liberalization is we've lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty as inequality has increased this is counterintuitive because you would imagine that you know poverty and inequality go hand in hand now i find that when many people when they talk about inequality they actually mean poverty they're thinking of the plight of poor people but that's a different thing and i think language kind of matters inequality per se need not necessarily be a problem i think it's a big problem in another domain which i'll ask you about rajeshwari later because you're a macro economist and th- therefore the perfect person for that now and, and you know another illustration of why uh, inequality is not a big deal poverty is is throughout history people have moved from towns to cities villages to towns they are moving to towards a place of greater inequality because what matters is escaping poverty and the reason i say this is that the solutions for both are all often opposite right and i think that there is a trade off between redistribution and growth yeah. i think what you really need to do is and i agree with you that in a desperately poor country where some 8000 children die every day of starvation you need certain kinds of welfare policies to alleviate that and enrega is a great thing however i would like to live in an india where enrega is not necessary where you know the rising tide has lifted all boats where we have greater economic growth so i just want to kind of conceptually yeah. uh, be sort of clear about this like i go by like harry frankfurt wrote a book called uh, on inequality where he came up with this concept i love which is a doctrine of sufficiency yeah. and that guides my thinking that my thinking is guided by does every person have enough to live a life of sufficiency which you can define any way you want right and i won't have a problem with whatever definition you come up with but the idea is let's take everybody there let's get out of poverty and therefore i find that there is this sort of you know when we conflate these two and when you know when we use inequality when we uh, mean poverty and when we come up with policies that might help inequality by making everybody equally poor you know that becomes an issue so when we talk of welfare and redistribution i get it at one level but i also feel disturbed at another level because the point is for example is become the riga now for all politicians in every election to say to the people farm loan waivers yeah. now farm loan waivers to me might be a necessary anesthetic at a moment in time yeah, yeah. but you are shifting the focus from the larger greater structural problems Absolutely. you need to resolve i don't even think that farm waiver is welfare policy I, I, because if you i mean there are countries amit where they have thought very well about what 
their welfare state's architecture ought to be like. Uh, China is one of them. Uh, Brazil is one of them. We can learn a lot from these countries. They have very different instruments. They use co-financed models of welfare. So there's social insurance as one example in combination with certain things which are universal transfers. We just, and I think this goes back to that point that I had made. I mean, if there's one sort of dream reform in my mind, it is a very clear articulation fiscally as well as between centre-state relations on what is the welfare architecture of India. Are you going to continue to have 464 schemes or do you want to learn from an Indonesia and maybe say, well, we'll have 10 big national schemes, Narega and PDS, one of them, uh, PMJ is one of them, PM Kisan is one of them, just throwing that out. And maybe the rest we do as untied grants to states and let states then decide and then that sort of harmoniously manages some of the center state politics as well. There are ways to do this. Again, one looks at the energy and enthusiasm. So to me, Amit, I think what I think we should retire is this idea that there is this conflict between welfare, redistribution and certain growth dividends when it comes to more productive assets and public goods provision. Actually, there are studies coming out of, you know, be it sub-Saharan Africa, be it Latin America, which show that if you do both carefully and together, they work very well. They're mutually reinforcing because if you have, if you give people a basic level of cash, for example, there is psychological assurance that you can take on risks in your businesses. Uh, you can take on risks in the jobs that you'll do. Uh, you can invest in education, right? They're both mutually reinforcing paradigms. But the question is, you need a policy articulation on what the balance between the two is. I think it's the Finance Commission, actually, where this needs to be articulated. They've done it quite well when it comes to disaster response funds. There's a very clear articulation of how that will be done. It worked quite well during the pandemic because state disaster response funds were being used, right, to actually respond to local crises. Because local crises are going to be very different. The national government can't manage it. We need to think very carefully, similarly, around the welfare question. So I don't disagree with I think in fact what your concern is I share that concern but to me I think what I think we should not think of is that the two are in conflict I think there has to be a very clear policy path much like in other countries where they are not in conflict and they are cyclical because what is Narega? Narega is not an anti-poverty program. I mean, people think it's that. It's actually a shock responsive safety net. So if you're in the middle of a shock, if you're dealing with something, you respond. Uh, we can argue whether it actually responds in some places and it doesn't in others based on local capacity. But I think you need to think very carefully about what are the different instruments of welfare you're putting in. It has to be a balance. You know, often, and now I realize I'm going into a rant on welfare policy and I will try and be brief, but there are three instruments of welfare. One is what we call protective measures, which is after you have fallen into poverty, it protects the poor, right? That you won't fall further below in your income. So it's almost ex post. There are preventive measures which tend to be much more co-financed because essentially you use your money now to save for a crisis in the future. So social insurance and there are promotional measures. So that's skill training, livelihoods programs, all these kinds of things. If you look at countries that have a healthy fiscal balance, right, of welfare, they use the three based on what the local economy looks like. So, you know, contexts where they are relying much more on agriculture, very susceptible to drought, you'll see, you know, cropping insurance mixed with food rations with a Narega, right? Like some example like that. India actually has, you know, the great uh, privilege of having all these different contexts because right now we have a welfare context where you have the same welfare programs running in urban, well, Maharashtra as well as Delhi. That makes no sense because actually even the amount of transfers that you need to give people are very different based on local consumption baskets, local minimum wage. We have no policy articulation right now on how to tackle this balance. Um, and I think to me, it's going to be one of the most important questions as economists, politicians, anyone in the sort of technocratic welfare domain space. Right now, I know we're in this political moment where everybody wants deeper transfers and support because there are some communities that are hurting. But I actually think the really important question is to think about how do we move from just thinking of it as just transfers to thinking of it as a policy path, which is fiscally sustainable so that those conflicts can be ironed out a bit or you have platforms just like GST, you have platforms which are center state which can organize then if there are conflicts which might happen. Um, I think that's really the need of the hour. I, I think one thing that I completely agree with, Amit, is that I think poverty is a bigger problem than inequality. And I think when we focus too much on inequality, then we are trying to solve a problem using policy actions and measures which 
may not necessarily address inequality and it creates a lot of other distortions in the process and i think it's there's unambiguous evidence from the history of economic growth so to speak that the one thing that really works in terms of uplifting people from poverty and improving their living standards is growth yeah. and you know there are for example my favorite examples of four countries which have made the transition from a developing country status to an oecd developed country status which is israel chile south korea and taiwan and they none of them did this using purely a redistributive model of development yeah. so to speak right i mean they they exclusively focused on growth promoting measures which were supported by the governments and that is what helped them to make the transition so i think there is no running away from the fact that the most important thing we need to be focusing on is growth and that is what's going to help over a period of time to alleviate poverty which is what has happened over the last several decades barring the last few years when even growth itself has stalled in india and i think by focusing too much on inequality and there is a trade off the trade off is because the the fiscal resources of the government are finite and the reason they are also finite is because once you are struggling on growth your automatically your tax to gdp ratio which is what the measure of fiscal uh, prowess of the government is that gets compromised right if you're not able to sort of increase the tax base then you are limited to a certain finite amount of tax to gdp and if you're not able to enlarge it then you are sort of trying to choose between i have 100 rupees what do i allocate this 100 rupees to i have to do this 460 for welfare schemes i have to do public good provision i also have to do other things and i think the indian state is really very badly stretched out in yeah. thousands of directions right i mean they are trying to do some rudimentary provision of public good and struggling at that they're trying to do welfare schemes they're struggling at that and they are doing many other things that they should not be doing and of course struggling at that right so you have this really finite limited fiscal resources which are being pulled at from multiple angles and then you're choosing that what fire am i going to put out and what battle am i going to fight and what's going to give me the highest returns in terms of let's say winning elections and staying in power and in the process what definitely gets compromised is growth because the state is doing hajar things which are inimical to growth in the country and they need to figure out that okay let's take a step back from all of these things and let growth take its course and yes when there are rare events when there are catastrophic events we need to have the budget to spend at that point of time which is what the government was not able to do this time because for years you've just been on a spending spree and when the time comes for you to actually provide the stimulus and the support needed you're suddenly worried about fiscal deficit and debt so the entire thinking about how do you support the economy in bad times how do you sort of step back and build a surplus during good times and how do you step away from this interfering into the growth which should be the job of the private sector that entire thinking has gone haywire and i think to a large extent we, we tend to obsess about inequality right and what inequality does i think it normalizes envy right i mean there is this thing that okay if the rich are get, getting richer we should be envious of that and that's just a very suboptimal outcome so to speak so for example when i when i when i when i teach my child or the values that i want to inculcate i don't want to tell her that be envious of the other kids in the building or the school i want to tell her that look at your own life in absolute terms build your own character and do the things that's going to make you happy irrespective of whether what the other person next to you is doing but therefore in, i think inequality it's the state of the nature there's inequality everywhere and i think at some point we just have to stop obsessing about the fact that economic policy actions should be catered towards addressing inequality we should focus on growth and and that is going to lead to the alleviation of poverty one thing that i do want to focus on here is i think there should be equality of opportunities so more than income inequality or wealth inequality etc it's the equality of opportunities that probably should receive a lot more focus on discussion uh, and that is where again we fail because the state is being squeezed into multiple directions yeah i i i just want to say a couple of things one i want to just push on this idea i don't think there is a growth versus distribution i i i a redistribution trade off i i know this is something in a very traditional sense in economics i think we're taught this but actually there's a lot of work that's coming out of and i'm particularly thinking of poor economics is about this right i mean there's an entire section of thinking about very careful rigorous experiments which show assets plus counseling short term transfers lead to businesses that grow which then 
there are long run spillover effects on the local economy right so i i i do want to sort of push this idea that you know one of the big reasons why there's this whole conversation on the basic income for example is this idea that in a precarious labor market you want some minimum assurance for everyone so that everyone has the access to one fairly large part of a significant transfer in india it may not need to go to everybody you could say it goes to say 80% of the informal economy for example and then at least with that assurance you are able to as we say partake in risk taking behavior or all kinds of you know economic goods which are good for growth i don't necessarily see them in conflict if there is a very clear coherent policy in place around social protection which i would agree right now doesn't exist in india i think the two can be consonant and they can be enforcing i think if i can uh, sort of push back on the push back yeah. uh, i would sort of say that one i agree that in theory there may not be as much of uh, a dichotomy as it may seem that you can have what you as you described it a policy path where you can have a, a some welfare policies happening and also growth happening however what happens in practice and what happens in the political mindset and what hap- you know what happens when it comes to scarce resources as rajeshwari said uh, is that there inevitably is Uh, a, a dichotomy in the sense that you will always privilege welfare policies more number 1 because they are much easier to sell it's much easier to uh, tell a voter that i'm giving you something as opposed to uh, b- telling him that i'm going to do a structural reform which will pay off in 10 years and blah 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 so in political sense all your incentives are towards just going for the welfare schemes whether you call them handouts or freebies or whatever you're giving something uh, uh, directly and also that then becomes a cop out that then becomes a way for you to say that i have done everything i could and it becomes a race to the bottom as it has with farm loan waivers and you use it to not address any of the core problems the way i look at it is this is that let's say i have a terrible backache at my lower back right the immediate thing is to give me an anesthetic to give me a crocine or if it's more severe to give me a good painkiller and uh, that then uh, you know relieves me of that pain but the point is you're not actually treating the disease what if i have pancreatic cancer which you know a lower back pain is one of the signs of you know you're not creating or treating the disease and you're also saying that oh i gave you something you know your pain is better i'm doing my job so that's really my worry there which is not to uh, argue for one or the other exactly. what i would say is that i'm completely okay my worry is that we just think of welfareism all the time even this current dispensation has realized yeah, that yeah. they can rely uh, rely on well delivered welfareism to take their eyes off the broader ball where they can do nonsense like demonetization yeah. and the bosch bosch up gst and so on and no one holds them accountable as rajeshwari pointed out so and uh, two points i'll make and and, and over to you then shaya so one is that i think you know it, it, theoretically it makes sense to say that we'll do a basic income scheme where we'll only target the most deserving and the needy people or let's say x percentage of the population but i think to execute something like that requires an enormous level of sophisticated state capacity where you identify who the exact recipients who are deserving are going to receive it then ensure that there's not going to be any leakage so i think that i don't think we even have anywhere remotely that kind of state capacity and i think what happens is once you have 464 welfare schemes it's very difficult to withdraw any scheme because all the, the incentive is then to is to pile on more and more schemes rather than withdraw anything clean up the system and just say that we are only going to stick to one scheme because fiscally we are constrained i don't think that ever happens in reality and and lastly i think what this government has done is that i think they've cleaned up the last mile delivery much better than the previous government so i think while there are still leakages but the last mile delivery has significantly become better and that again goes going back to my original point that is where the accountability system be- comes even more problematic because if i'm actually getting the delivery of the welfare schemes better than what i used to before in my mind this government is doing better than the previous government right and therefore what am i going to really hold the, this government accountable for so and and lastly i think the countries which have which have a welfareist social state with the successful redistributive policy are also the ones which have very high levels of gdp and per capita income because that generates the fiscal resources that you would need in order to continue and sustain an efficient redistribution program and also you have social spending on healthcare and education i mean look at indian government the pandemic exposed it less than 2% of yeah. the gdp is being spent on the healthcare but you have a whole lot of welfare schemes but that's the palliative that amit was mentioning about 
Okay, a couple of things. One, India spends about 2% of GDP on all of its welfare schemes. So again, this goes back to the fact, I think we keep thinking that, in fact, in our mind, I think we think the Indian government spends much more on welfare than it actually does. So that's the first thing. And I think for those who are interested in the breakdown on this, we have the World Bank and the IMF have a series of reports. I've authored some of them looking at budgets. So I think it's not the case. In fact, we're spending... Health and education, certainly you could spend more, but it's not that there's a trade-off between spending more on education, spending more on welfare, because that's not happening. Never has happened in our politics, number one. Number two, I think on the question of targeting, actually, I, I mean, I work on targeting. In fact, the public distribution system and when the pandemic hit, PMGKY showed you have the Jandhan Yojana, you have the public distribution system. They are near universal. We have a paper for those who are interested. It's called From Intent to Implementation. It uses CMIE data to track what happened with PMGKY transfers. And what we essentially find is not just us, there are others who've done surveys. And what we find is the PDS distribution system actually in terms of identifying targeting is extremely effective because it's universal and it's constantly being used. And one of the things that people like Rajesh Bansal, who used to be, in fact, briefly at the RBI, was with the DBT mission, essentially wrote a paper saying, why don't we create a who-to-pay database using the PDS? So actually, to your point about targeting and basic income, in fact, now in policy conversations that I am part of, one constantly hears the lament that this is so easy to do and it would also then put a squeeze on the remaining 464 why don't we start to move in that direction? And some states have. So Tamil Nadu, for instance, is using the PDS to essentially do an income transfer. There are other states that are going to start to move in that direction. So actually, I think that the execution of at least some of the basic income stuff is much more doable. So I'm really glad we are all agreed on one thing. One, what a relief it is that that damn drilling noise has stopped. I'm sorry, dear listeners, what happened was that suddenly, unexpectedly, and this never happens, there was some drilling at an apartment upstairs or downstairs, which you heard. So I went to the two flats upstairs, the two flats above that, then the two flats below me, and finally two floors below me. Uh, there were people who were drilling and they kindly offered to stop drilling. They did not understand recording. So I had to tell them I'm live with BBC to London and I'm going to lose a lot of money. Please, uh, I really did say that. Wow. And uh, then th we kind of managed to uh, sort of make them stop the drilling. So I hope this episode is worth it. Now, uh, yeah, so I mean, the lot of thought-provoking stuff on welfare and uh, growth to think about. And what I'm glad about is at the fundamental level, we are on the same page. Growth is important. There's no getting away from it. And in the short term, you know, if you can alleviate the pain of people, that's a good thing and it must be done. Unfortunately, this is often seen in dichotomous terms. And my worry is that it ends up being a dichotomy at the political level. But leave that aside. I want to actually now, you know, before we go to the break and we uh, begin with, uh, uh, and after that, we'll talk about your life, Rajeshwari. You are not getting away from that. But before that, I want to bring up one of the Twitter questions because I think it leads us to an interesting area that both of you alluded to. And a couple of questions. Raghuram Janak asks, where did we in brackets India go wrong economically in the last eight years and what should be the key area of focus going forward Nasra Guram Janak and Jordan Khusro which is a delightful name by the way though on Twitter you never know if it's the real name it, it you know no one on the internet knows I'm a dog you've seen that old cartoon uh, I think I it's a New York cartoon <laughs> yeah. yeah no but we're not calling Jordan a dog I'm just saying it's a nice name uh, and he asks when did e India's economic decline start was it during Mughals or during British Raj <laughs> or earlier than that stop quote and I'll attempt a brief answer to that and saying that no you don't need to go so far back <laughs> the truth is that our economic governance has been miserable for most of our history there was a t golden 20 year period from 1991 to 2011 when things were looking up and were moving in the right direction and for the last 10-11 years or so it's been a disaster I've got an episode with Pooja Mehra called The Lost Decade um, on her book about you know how all of this happened she takes you into the weeds and you uh, get to learn exactly in terms of policy what went wrong and it started going wrong before this particular dispension and this particular dispension of course made it much worse for reasons Rajeshwari mentioned like demonetization the boss GST and so on and I've also done an episode on the 1991 reforms about why we did have that uh, 20 year old golden period and uh, you know in spe in terms of specific policies and how our way of thinking changed you know and and the point that i want to underscore here is that a number of the questions are also talking about how right wing economists have gone wrong and i feel that this is people conflate 
मोदीज इकोनॉमिक पॉलिसीज विद राइट विंग जस्ट बिकॉज सोशली इट्स कॉल राइट विंग आई थिंक द स्पेक्ट्रम ऑफ लेफ्ट एंड राइट इन इंडिया डजेंट रिली वर्क बट इफ यू रियली लुक एट इट ऑल ऑफ इंडियाज इकोनॉमिक्स एक्सेप्ट फॉर पार्ट्स ऑफ द ट्वेंटी ईयर पीरियड हैव इन स्टैटिस्ट एंड देर फॉर लेफ्ट विंग इन अ सेंस मार्केट्स हैवन बीन अलाउड टू प्ले आई हैड द कांग्रेस पॉलिटिशियन सलमान सोज ऑन दिस शो एंड सलमान सेट डेट इन ट्वेंटी फोर्टीन वेन मोदी वन ही वॉज एक्चुअली ऑप्टिमिस्टिक बिकॉज ऑफ Uh, the noises modi had made about freeing up markets and getting away from statism modi did nothing of that he doubled down on policies of the past he showed the top down central planning of nehru he showed the authoritarian streak of uh, uh, indira uh, if anything the ruthlessness of sanjay gandhi even and so on and so forth which is why we are in this mess you know, so this perception that some people have that oh you know uh, left wing versus right wing in economics it's all fundamentally statist and there is no freedom at all uh, in fact all our parties <coughs> are left on economics and right on social issues as arun shuri famously said you know a upa is equal to nda plus cow and of course these days i think what we uh, sort of need to uh, worry about is the cow aspect of it of how our society is torn apart and there was a, a, another question from twitter from uh, a gentleman named rohit tripathi saying how long can economists ignore the coming up out of the social fabric it's a serious <laughs> question and to this i just want to say that hey <laughs> economists are not ignoring any coming up out of the social fabric economics of uh, economists of people just like people are and every economist i know is you know aghast at it and there's another question which this is a good time to address where someone i won't name because i'm going to diss the question i asked about uh, you know what question should i ask you guys and this person said quote ask them what they were doing in the niti aayog when this government ran down the economy into pieces ask why did they whitewash modi <laughs> stop quote why did you guys whitewash modi I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about at this yeah. point of time no i th- i think this particular gentleman just saw the word economist yeah. and got enraged and triggered by that and went off into this rant and the truth is that yeah. i actually have a filter for who i allow on the show and one of my litmus tests is that if you supported demonetization you are never coming on the show right i made one quasi exception for arvin subramaniam and i asked him all the tough questions so if anyone feels that i don't ask tough don't get those people on and um, and we had a very civil conversation but i asked all the tough questions including about demon I think there is a huge amount of simplification that's happening here right i mean the word economist is getting conflated with with just this one kind of an entity who works for the government in a government think tank and supports yeah. supports all the policies that's coming out of the pmo or the mof and not protesting all the bad things that's happening this some kind of a non-existent entity that's in the minds of people no i remember at the time of uh, demon uh, i wrote this strong editorial about useful idiots uh, lenin's phrase not literally <laughs> calling people <laughs> idiots where where i said any economist who support demonetization is either a bad economist or a bad human being yeah. and yeah. i and i kind of stand by that yeah. and every economist in fact i would lean more to What's the latter? More towards yeah. the latter. Yeah, me too. Absolutely. Because, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. I absolutely agree. Because yeah. all the examples who come to my mind are bad human beings. And actually, yeah. demonetization was an event that almost split the world into there are two kinds of people, right? I mean, those who yeah. support yes. and those who don't. Absolutely. It became crystal clear, and since then, it has just been a slippery slope. No, and also, I think you know what. I mean I don't know if one should be held culpable for it but there's also a failure on the part of economists like most the majority of economists basically almost all economists opposed it because it is bad shit crazy yeah. as my friend Sadan Anthu may say yes. it's bad shit yes. right and yet there is a public perception that oh the economists supported modi ji all of which are completely untrue yeah, yeah. and yeah. Uh, you know but I'll tell you something and I wrote a piece uh, in fact at the end of last year uh, about this so i go to a lot of delhi parties right and uh, this i think goes back to this gentleman who was so enraged with the use of the phrase economist i go to a lot of delhi parties and this was a new year's thing and i'd been and i was generally talking to someone and because as you know i'm a nerd i have really nothing else to talk to people about other than the economy and numbers right i have really nothing else and so i was talking to some gentleman in their 50s who for some some reason all of them have a crush on milan soman i want everyone to know this one gentleman in his 50s listen amit rajeshwari let me tell you in north india now amongst the elite gents this is something i believe men in their 50s they all want to be as fit 
as Milan Soman is now that he is in his 50s. And I think they also aspire to like all his triathlete abilities and all of that. But it's a good thing to aspire to. I suppose, I suppose. I Even mean, we I can would debate. like to look like Milan Soman. Yeah, I know I, it's kind of not possible. It, it, but you know, it's <laughs> a good aspiration to harbor. Okay, I, I mean, I have other thoughts which I will keep to myself for the time being. But... The point being, I remember I started, someone asked me what I did. And I mentioned that I am an economist at the World Bank. Immediately, there was this sniggering um, cynicism. And they said, oh, but you're, an, and they said this in Hindi, in almost half hate Punjabi. They said, but you're an economist. What will you know about the economy? And that is, I think, the current rep of uh, the community. And I completely agree with Rajeshwari. I think it is a... It's a strange kind of morphing of who you think an economist is. But the other thing that makes it really complicated is that these were gentlemen who were all running businesses. And they felt, and this I think goes back to also the point that Amit was making about how much we make economics accessible in the way people think about the world. All these guys seem to believe that they had the pulse on the real economy because they hired people, they were fighting with their workers, they were producing things. And they said, we know, and what do you know? And I think there is this competition now. We do live in this post-truth world. There are competitions about who gets to assert what fact and how facts are constructed. And I think... Honestly, when I was sitting there, I mean, at this particular social gathering, I realized it's very difficult because what I can now share with them, they will just dismiss as technicalese. You know, this is just, don't bore me with this stuff. Also, I, I wonder to what extent social media has a role yes. to play here, right? The kind of economists who are vocal on social media are probably of a very different type, believing in some things as wanting to support the government, wanting to come across as, I don't want to criticize the government for anything, for whatever reason they may have in their minds. And I think that's what the people who are also on social media get to witness and read. And in their mind, these are the economists who have all the power and who have all the uh, prestige and everything, and they have access to the government and they are the ones who are messing up with the economy and they are the so it's like a you know that is what is getting created using the social media I'm completely guessing because I myself am not on social media See you're like I could say to you what the factory owner said to her that you know True. yeah Yes I don't it? know the economy because I'm not on social media in the sense, you don't know social media because you're not on social That's media. That's also true. Yes. <laughs> so, the yeah. economy so is which nothing. Which is why I said, I, yeah. I, I mean, what Shaina would not say in the party that I'm guessing, here I am admitting, I'm guessing mm. that this could be happening in social media. My uh, sense is, and, and you're right, you're, you're uh, right to, uh, but what I'd add to this is that I think social media incentivizes extreme expression. Yes. Because, and it's almost the opposite of what people call the median voter theorem, right? The median voter theorem basically is that in a democracy, with two parties, both of them will be as close to the center as possible. They'll practically be identical in the same way that if you have an ice cream vendor on a beach, you know, he can put his cart anywhere. But if there are two of them, they'll both try to be as close to the center as possible. So they have the largest whatever, which is why in the US, you used to have a situation where during the primaries, people would swing to the extremes and talk to the core voters. But during the ma main elections, they'd be next to each other. So when I look at 2016, for example, uh, you know, two candidates from the different parties who were really close to each other in everything were Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton. And of course, someone on the extremes won and that swing to the extremes. So I think what social media also does is once you join social media, if you get attracted to, say, an ideological tribe of any kind on either side, if you want to raise your status within that tribe, you know, how do you do it? By becoming more and more shrill. Yeah. And it's a race to the extremes. Like even that uh, Mahasamilan of so-called Hindu priests, which we had, you know, people like Yati yeah. Narsin Anand and all that. You know, if any of them was to individually give a speech anywhere, I don't think they would be so rabid. But by the fact that they're all together and they all want to stand out and in a sense are competing for the attention, I think they were driven to even further extremes and then solidified in those positions. Also, I think, Amit, what this reflects is the overarching growing trend of polar polarization in the country. Exactly, right? Yeah. I mean, this is, if, despite social media being around, this was not the case pre-2014 to this extent. And the growing trend of polarization has also polarized economists and the economists who are vocal on social media. And I, and I do read them occasionally when they're writing their op-eds and giving speeches, it's absolutely obnoxious because 
they know i'm i'm hoping they know that no economic theory logic argument yeah. would support what they're saying but they are saying what they're saying because they have certain other motives and positions and rank in mind and that that's the great disservice they are doing to the larger community of economists and we are all getting confused and conflated together as we all belong to that's one entity which well, is not true one minority of uh, spineless people no i remember in fact after demonetization a, dic- a diktat went out to all their uh, you know people under the pay that you got to defend it in public so you had people defending demonetization through columns or through tv sound bites in ways that you know that this guy has written excellent books this guy is smart he knows this is not true I'll still tell you what he's talking with nonsense me during demonetization i was extremely vocal on tv channels yeah. i was getting invited by prominent tv channels one of the tv channels itself got uh, suffered as a result i think so i was getting called in tv channels i was writing in the media because it was a complete shock to my sister the way i know of it forget economics the way i know the country to be the way i know the people to be the very fact that nobody protested i still can't fathom that right yeah. so i was very vocal about it but then lo and behold after a couple of months i was indirectly told that i am voicing my opinion too much uh, and it's coming out as too anti establishment and i need to tone it down so imagine i mean i am as small and trivial in the larger scheme of things as can be if i am facing some a backlash of this kind what other more prominent people would be facing if they wanted to speak up against demon and and since then as i said it's been a slippery slope downhill because you just can't speak up against the establishment i mean i did a lot of work against the gdp data the official gdp data uh, but then there's backlash there as well you just can't criticize anything that is wrong in the establishment in the polity in the policy in the economics space and therefore the economists who are getting legitimacy who are getting the sort of the front page whatever columns uh, who are getting the social media voice are the ones who are towing the party line so i think that is we are sort of getting relegated to the background and maybe to some extent we are at fault as well i mean maybe we should grab social media we should be as vocal as well but i know that's that's a different debate you know but one thing so my job in fact in the the technical hat that i wear it actually involves being very behind the scenes because you know the world bank typically will only support indian government programs be it states so on and so forth and what's funny is that even so i completely agree with what you know i think both of you are saying on social media and the public part of the economic discourse but in the private part because i i see the other part even there i see so much fear um confusion as well because now what's happened is you know i actually really do want to double down on that one handed economist argument because everyone just seems to have 17 things to say and you can't land at one fact so to you know for action everyone must coalesce around a few facts and i've realized even in private conversations and people just can't coalesce that's number 1 and i see this particularly i think the higher up you go in states i actually think there's still coalitions around facts um i notice that as you start to deal with a lot of national agencies things do start to change the other thing i notice which is actually even i think something that makes me quite cautious and worried is that um even if there is a coalition around facts now there's a sense that well i mean what will happen you know there used to be the entrepreneurial bureaucrat right earlier we all know this person like who would sort of navigate the corridors of power would push for things what i increasingly also notice is that even that instinct right of being rewarded it's really just you know it's it's really changed and i think if the private side of it also where you're not really public facing is like this you know where is the sort of push and the charge in the system going to come from it has to change equilibrium so i guess i'm sounding now as pessimistic as you um, amit which is quite worrying um i'm optimistic on other parts maybe outside the government systems but i fully agree and i think the other issue where i do think that there's a lot of enthusiasm though is i see for example you know there are these um, young people often i notice who are very active on social media i mean i'm thinking of a road scholar or there are these you know they're just putting out facts and they're calling out nonsense and uh, it's actually quite wonderful to see so i i think while i fully agree with i think what rajeshwari is saying i also think almost the antidote to that is probably going to come from some of these more f- the flatter platforms right because even in private in government i just don't see the i don't see slack in the system i think everyone is either too cynical or perhaps too 
concerned about just what's the point in pushing for action when nothing will happen. And I actually think it's going to be a lot of sort of younger students who are perhaps now much more, you know, creating their own spaces where I think a lot of the real creative energies or like the push for change might come from. So in fact, I'll say that on this point, I mean, something as fundamental as has the economy recovered from the pandemic, yeah. right? It is at, at the top of all our minds. Economists, non-economists, everybody wants to know this. But there is no consensus on something that should be based yes. on data, where all the data, majority of it should speak in the same direction. I mean, if you think about uh, the 2010 onward slowdown, at least by now there is a consensus, which many of us had to really struggle to establish a consensus that you know since 2010 the economy has indeed been slowing down. And it took us 10 years uh, Puja wrote an amazing book. Ajay Shah Vijay Kelka wrote the book. And it took us a long time to tell people, yes, the economy was in doldrums. The economy was in a bad shape. Now, as we're living through it, has the economy recovered from the pandemic or not? It should not be a very difficult question to answer when you have access to multiple data series, much more than we had in 60s and 70s, where the only data where we would look at is GDP. Today, you have Hajar series that you can look at and you can construct a, a, a story. What is the factual story? What's the fact? But we can't seem to arrive at a consensus even on that because there the government agencies are spinning a completely different story. Their version of the reality is that everything is going hunky-dory, we are back to where we were, the recovery is going full on and we are on track to become that whatever $5 trillion, whatever the, the, the number is, right? But then when you look at the data, when you analyze it, as economists, you see that that is not the case. I mean, the economy is really struggling. There are multiple pockets of worry and we can talk about it if we want to. But why is there such lack of transparency on the behalf of the government agencies who are most responsible for putting up the truth in front of the common people? So it's almost almost like you're putting a facade in front of their eyes. You want to drink a different Kool-Aid and you want to convince them with a different narrative. And therefore, you're going to pursue a policy also that is suitable to that when you've gotten the very basics of it wrong. And therefore, everything that follows after that is also wrong. And can I just add, I mean, one of the biggest challenges is that we just don't, even data, I mean, we still don't, we don't know what our poverty rate is. We, you know, we were talking about poverty and inequality. The NSS and MOSPI, which used to put out, churn out information, uh, we just haven't had a consumption round. I don't even know what's happening with the census, to be honest. I, I believe it was supposed to happen. Then now it's again, there are questions. And some of these core institutions that were supposed to generate basic facts around the world, of the world, we are just not seeing those being published. And to me, honestly, I was on a panel recently discussing how to better feminize data. And this wonderful economist I was on the panel with, she actually turned at the end, we were talking and she said, you know, all these very exciting ideas of like making women's voices more representative in data, that's all very nice. But right now we just need the data. We just need <laughs> any basic, even if it's masculine data, give us something. And I think especially for those who work in the social sectors and so on, it's even more worrying because, you know, NFHS is not fully complete. Uh, there are questions about, you know, what is the sampling rounds? And we these are things actually that, again, not rocket science. These are things that, you know, these are institutions that are used to it. But to me, in fact, the most fundamental, anyone asks me anything about what to do with the about the economy, not that lots of people ask me, but when people do ask me, the one thing I actually say is just get, just some core fundamental data just needs to be published because we are just right now flying blind. So I completely want to double down on what Rajeshwari said along with publish the data. Couple of questions here. And one is, of course, I've discussed data with every economist on the show, including both of you in the different episodes we've done and we know why it's a problem. And I'll just be pessimistic and say that the fact that so many government institutions, for example, are not forthcoming with data is not going to change. And the answer for that is a classic economist answer of incentives, right? It's yeah. not going to change. It is the way it is. So the, the two related questions I have are, one, how do you cope without it? What are the kind of proxies that you use? And the second one, which is almost the same question, but slightly different is that if someone listening to the show or a citizen like me just wants to know that how do I know? How are things? Right? Because you have an informal sector which, uh, you know, uh, is not measured directly. You try to figure out other ways of trying to, you know, comment how it's doing. That we know it's been uh, demolished by uh, demonetization, GST, COVID, all of these uh, things coming together. Um, so, 
you know and like like you know shana you spoke about the businessmen you're meeting who are running factories so they think everything is fine they're seeing one part of the elephant you might see another part of the elephant rajeshwari might see another part of the elephant uh, given my current girth all of you are looking at me so <laughs> the, the the you know i got to i'll take a digress we were not because you're speaking we were looking at no, you no, okay amit amit you know what he is he sensitive about now so i'll 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 <laughs> i'll tell you a joke over here i read this lovely tweet by someone i've forgotten who i'll try and find it and link it but the tweet basically is something to the effect of i fell into the river and i drowned and when they pulled my body up the person who pulled it up and said look it's so bloated and grotesque and the person next to him said oh he fell in just a minute ago <laughs> so yeah so that's my self deprecating joke out of the way i think after let's, the let's, economy let's we need to talk now. about self love <laughs> <laughs> you're going to regale other, us with gossip other, after other, this other session so other terms I just have one thing to offer on data. There are lots of issues with CMI, but I am so grateful that CMI exists. Let's take a minute to just you know celebrate that, because had it not been for that, I at least in our work, my day to day work, we partnered with CMI. The World Bank now actually finances some core modules around social protection, safety nets, uh, some questions on health. we are using all of that to just understand what's happening at least in our area of work so i'm very grateful and yes i know that there are challenges and those are things that can be tested expanded so on and so forth that's very helpful and i think for anyone at least in my domain anyone interested in trying to understand what's happening to welfare uh what's happening to social policy i find in particular azim premji university keeps now almost an aggregated database and one they come out with this fabulous report which i think everyone should see it's the state of you know what is happening to the labor market they produce it now every year which is just wonderful and they use a combination of data sources i find that very useful and the second is they actually now aggregate information and they keep it so for anyone who wants to know what's happening from very different organizations I find that that now is often almost the beginning point, and then you can sort of follow through. So I I think I had those two, uh, but I I do want to say that even with all of this, uh, we've had government data forever and ever, and there have always been incentives to hide that data, but it was published, and uh, it is really a shame that that is not happening anymore. So. So I have a few points to add. One is that uh, I completely agree with Shaina, and what you said is that the one serious damage that has happened over the last decade or so is that the trust in data is gone, right? And once again, when we say data here, people are not making the distinction between official, private, government. To them, the trust in data is gone. And so, if you are quoting some numbers and telling me this is what is happening, how do I even know that I can trust those numbers? And that is, it, it's like at the core and heart of economics as a social science. You can't even trust the numbers. What are you going to talk about analyzing the numbers and coming up with interpretations, right? And this, I completely agree. What what Shreya also said is that earlier the situation. I mean, we have always had state capacity problems, even in data. collection and data generation but it was never as dire as it is today because we never had a situation of suppression of official data and the moment the government starts suppressing data you obviously start feeling very alerted that what exactly is going on in the economy how bad is the situation that the government feels the need to suppress something as big as a consumption survey result right so and on what has happened over the last 5 6 years is that despite repeated criticisms writing uh, we have all talked about about it in public forums written about it done research on it beat the gdp data beat the consumption data employment unemployment survey there has been no addressing from the side of the government there has been no acknowledgement that is there is a problem and we're looking into it right or there has been no steps taken by the statistical organization of the country that okay yes we are going to do abc in order to address some of these problems and because it has been a one sided criticism sort of we are lamenting and we are complaining and we are criticizing with nothing coming from the other side i think at some point people just give up and say fine we can't just use the official data anymore because but 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 what i feel a little bit sad about is that we we know that the gdp data for example has problems but we still continue to look at the gdp data to understand how the economy is doing right because the nso etc have not taken any steps to address the problems people have sort of forgotten about it right it's like a the memory is very short short lived and now we have normalized the problems and we have internalized it and we are going forward with it which is quite problematic because that legitimizes all the problems that exist in the series still for example when i tell my students 
students to do research explicitly tell them you can't use gdp as a continuous time series for 50 years there is a break in between but how many people are really going to be doing that so therefore the conclusions that you're getting could be erroneous at different levels but that is just one official series on multiple other series what happens is when you can't trust one big official data as i said that gets influenced into all the other series which number can you trust which you cannot i for example have a hard time trusting any official data and which is very bad for a macro economist because okay. for macro you have to use official data so what i end up doing is i have started looking a lot to my micro data and micro data coming from private sources of course one huge source of data is center for monitoring and economy the cmi has done massive public service by collecting all the data at a firm level at a household level the only problem is it's not going to be accessible to the common person because it is expensive right it's subscription based you can't subscribe to a cmi data just like that so i think there it probably the responsibility lies with economists like us who can access the data to make it accessible to the common person in whichever form and shape we can so i think looking at micro data is the way to go you can't look at macro official level data anymore and look at a large number of disaggregated series so for example i would look at two wheeler sales i would look at auto sales right all of these data coming from so even if they're coming from different ministries and different departments at least there i have the hope that not everything in dis- at a dis- disaggregated level is messed up right so you look at a bunch of disaggregated series and you try to piece a story together uh, and you sort of back it up using micro level data from private sources i think the way to go for india increasingly is private data I think we have to move away from this official monopoly over data because we have seen the risks and the dangers associated with that and the lack of accountability and lack of credibility and transparency right so i think at some point of time we have to realize that there has to be a lot of private sector involvement in data data collection data generation data dissemination in whichever form and shape it can be uh, because at least there is a little bit more accountability there because they are they are responsible to their shareholders or to whoever the stakeholders are um, so they are prob- hopefully not going to be as uh, you know sort of ignorant about or or careless about uh, all of these problems so i definitely think that private sector data and to the extent possible primary level data collection i think secondary data the moment is collected by government agencies runs into all these problems so surveys conducted by private organizations like cmi if you get funding conducting own surveys to get i mean i'm talking about researchers at this point of time right Pri- primary level data and and that's that's real tragic because you know it takes up a lot of time effort energy to even put the data together and we are far away from even reaching the state where you can analyze the data and say something about the economy so to answer the question on Twitter I I honestly don't have a good answer to that I mean what do I say for example to my mother who just asks me okay what number do I look at to understand uh, you know is the future for the next 5 years going to be good or bad or how is the economy doing after the pandemic I don't know what to say to her I mean am I going to sit and explain to her or look at abc series of course not so I think it's a, it's a failing by the way not just in India I I think it's happening all over the world all over the world there is problem with data I was I was in in Paris 2019 before the lockdown happened and there was a big oecd level data conference conference and the main title of the conference was trust in official statistics so it's a problem that's happening in ems and developing countries all over the world i mean we have always known china has data problems and now we have woken up to the reality that all ems have data problems so i think private sector collecting data primary level survey primary level data collection that's the way to go i mean we have to increasingly move away from government data sources although and i think the challenge here is going to be i i I I support that the exactly. Data, yeah. The problem is I think we're in this very odd catch 22 when it comes to data. So if you have government data, then you know there are problems with it. But if you use for example, see we know what happens when in and you know I write sometimes reports for the government, immediately there will be questions about well what about this source it's incomplete. So nothing because it's not even like the good is becoming the enemy of the perfect here it's almost like half the data is becoming the enemy of the other half and what does that mean it's a zero sum game in the end there's like nothing that you can trust and we seem to now just be stuck in this and you know i think what is a very helpful hopeful example of maybe the solution out is take asar for example uh they went out and constructed their own metrics of education they did not rely on anything government they didn't recreate a government survey they just said we want to do something on our own they went out and they have a machinery which is very well financed supported motivated because they are they are focused on a cause 
and they cover and measure this data and i think it has actually now led to although the government does, does dispute right they say we have our own <laughs> learning measures but at the end of the day that tussle has led to something that is actually more is prior to improving it is actually now a better equilibrium of how we understand learning data to be i think that kind of work now has to slowly start to happen i don't think it can happen in everything because i don't think the private sector has the resources to even manage i mean then the real question is what is our large statistical machinery also supposed to be doing right either you say well we want to just dismantle it or you focus on collecting gdp data better and figure out why you know there are all these inconsistencies i, I think the real question has to be a few areas for example consumption to me is one of the core areas because you can't say anything about the economy without knowing what's happening to household consumption and right now that's still very much up in the air so i think i would actually be very narrow i would say you know take a few measures which really do then help build up and do have links to all kinds of policy domains consumption to me is one of them more than perhaps even income because i've realized income is so noisy you're never going to uh, this is just for anyone listening i think all of us know this but it's important to say don't believe household income estimates when people are just average on reporting them because it's just the noisiest dirtiest measure right but consumption on the other hand particularly if you collect it in a certain way that to me is where i agree i think the private sector has to come in given that right now the public sector is not taking care of that knowledge good so i think i just double down but i'd be very narrow and i'd say look at the asar example as almost a pathway out of this bad equilibrium we're in and perhaps try and recreate that around consumption right and and i'm honestly the sense i have is it's probably going to be organizations like cmi who will have to sort of improve the measure improve the sample you know all these engage with the feedback that they're getting from different quarters and try and see how can we make it more accessible that you know consumption data is just more easily accessible it's rigorous and it's standardized uh while we keep waiting for the next nss consumption round to come out and i don't know when that will so, be so so i think we definitely need more cmis um in the sense that you know cmi itself took a very long time to be legitimate mm. and today for example we don't talk about the unemployment data coming out from the government we talk about the labor force participation rate which is almost exclusively a cmi construct uh, before cmi came up with the women labor force participation rate of less than 10% nobody was worried about women unemployment right because we just could not measure it so i think it takes time i think cmi took almost 20 30 years but they have found the legitimacy and today vast sections of researchers and everybody they are practitioners everybody is using cmi data to understand some parts of the economy and there i think the the big value addition they have done is they have one other than looking at households data which is very important they've also start they've been looking for the longest of time at farm level data and farm level data gives you a lot of picture about what's happening in the economy because ultimately it's the farms that are producing gdp so who are the farms borrowing from how many are they employing i mean what is what is the kind of output they're producing that gives you that micro level picture which you can then use to get a sense of what's happening in the economy so i think we definitely need more cmis and they have figured out the resourcing as well because they're sort of selling the data as a good as an output that they're producing and and that is something that just has to happen more sr completely i agree with that and i think th the need for the government statistical organization or the government machinery apparatus is for example to do something do something like census mm -hmm. like nobody other than the government can do a census mm -hmm. or even to calculate gdp right? right i mean gdp has a kind of official legitimacy across countries of the world that no other indicator can ever match up to with all its shortcomings so to that extent i think they will be there and they will be used by government agencies themselves but there has to be this parallel data movement uh, spearheaded by organizations like sr and cmi uh, so that we don't get sort of you know blindsided by suppression of reports and problematic yeah. data can i just you know one thing and this is actually this is actually what makes me really sad about what's happened to the statistical arc architecture of india because actually there's a very what was the original statistical architecture of india and rajeshwari like it was it was a boys club of like bangali and some malayali men i say calcutta yeah exactly and and you know it was fish eaters exactly yeah and what's actually really interesting and it's something i've been like following now 
maybe something i'll do in the future is that actually it is an architecture that became much more feminized much more inclusive our premier now data journalists so many really good data scientists are women um there was a lot of work there was something called the delhi group that used to sit together with the nss there were people like ranana jhabwala and so many people involved in trying to make sure that women's work unpaid and un, you know all of that was measured by the formal government machinery and that really fed into this big crisis now that we discuss around labor force issues so it's not like this was not an architecture that was not open to change reform absorbing it was actually a very progressive it was moving in that direction and then now we're in this place where rajesh ji and i are saying things like well we need to look at you know someone else to collect consumption and you just do the census it, it actually i mean it's a it, it is depressing but again because i want to sort of end on i want to focus on hope as opposed to depression we still do have agencies that are collecting this data they are attack left right center but they're they're dealing with it and cmi is one of them and you also have a uh, organizations during the covid pandemic it was you know swan put out an entire report on what was happening to migrant workers there there are all kinds of organizations who are producing now data um i think now it's going to perhaps be required of donor organizations or development agencies or these organizations to think about how do we standardize some of these modes of collection because there is going to be a lot of data collection that's going to happen now outside and it won't even be technically survey agencies or you know the private vendor it will be other organizations um and some standardization in that would also be good by the way one thing i want to add to be fair is that there are some government data which are definitely better than the rest so for example when we look at inflation um and we have looked carefully at the cpi inflation measurement etc uh, that is definitely at par with what's done with the western countries and there is very little room for doubting that data per se so there are some series where the statistical organization is still doing a very good job but at the same time there are other series like consumption unemployment gdp where there are problems so i think the problem there is a, a common person wouldn't know how do you distinguish between a bad gdp and a good inflation data right so for example in the us they came up with this amazing project called one billion prices where you are basically collecting data on retail prices from the websites like amazon etc and all the online retail websites that there are and your every day you're basically setting an algorithm where the computer is going and scraping data from all the websites on a daily basis and hourly basis and you get really high frequency price level data from the online retail in the us of course it's even better because there's a large presence of online retail to the extent in india we have a big basket and amazon a flipkart it's even possible to do in india and i know that there are economists who have done that so i think all of these efforts you may not end up using it for anything but it makes it that much harder for government agencies to sort of i i don't want to use the word fool you but it makes it that much harder for the government agencies to hide uh, what the actual truth is because you just have many series out there uh, and together somebody will question that oh no but why that number is looking like this and why is yours like that and there is definitely some benefit to that So a final sort of question before we go into the break uh, by final I don't mean final final abhi to sham baki hai but uh, which is this that you know earlier we spoke about how there's been a sort of continuity in terms of economic ideo- ideology across governments there are all statist and distrust markets and so on and so forth there's also been a good kind of continuity that has been there at parts within the policy establishment in the same sense that Ajay spoke about th- that ecosystem building up in the late 80s so in 91 when the reforms happened you had that uh, you know cadre of people who could carry that shit out similarly you know in uh, under vajpayee's government they were always talking to the opposition when that transition happened in 2014 for a while as pooja uh, uh, writes in a book the lost decade uh, you know you had chidambaram's people kind of continuing with jetli's people and there was a continuity there till a few months into uh, uh, you know the regime as it were everything went to hell so now the question is a dual one one is what is you know in terms of continuity has in terms of that sense that we are all working to solve the same problem has something broken down drastically and therefore is this degradation of uh, all of these institutions which give us data is that degradation you know willful malice or is it just incompetence and perhaps the next time around it can get uh, you know there is hope that uh, we might get back on the uh, path of progress So I'll say two things. The 
the statistical machinery and this is by the way true of the indian bureaucracy i mean this is i think a uh, the way the bureaucracy is architected you have you know what i wouldn't even use call it the flailing state but essentially the idea that you have people who are technical minds up top who have always been very bright dynamic but even with the statistical machinery prior to this particular phase there were lots of issues about recruitment training management of the local levels of data collection management so i almost feel that it was a system which was ready for a crisis because there were signs of all of this already coming out and 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 i i have sympathy for those in for example mospi who say that there's a reason why also technical reasons why to do with staff to do with design to do with all kinds of questions that some of the data is not so i have sympathy for that i have no patience for it but i have sympathy for it if you you know i think those are two different things um It's so it's almost like you're talking about your children or something yeah, if you would have them yeah, i have yeah, patience but I do, <laughs> sympathy I do, but not I patience i do i do i i actually i don't know i really i you know this i mentioned this in my book i have a lot of i think i've grown up around statisticians when i was very young they, they are in my life and i think there is a lot of i know it's a very tough job and being a surveyor is is probably one of the toughest jobs in this country to collect any to elicit responses from people and you know this amit and so i think for me yes maybe maybe not children like that's I a bit pedantic it, i find it damn easy actually yeah you <laughs> find it very easy i'm sure but maybe we but, should put you kidding. in the statistical yeah. organization yeah yeah i think it's but, yeah but yeah, you need a million of me yes exactly which i'd be difficult we'll clone you. also i have a feeling he'll just go off in some other tangent and it's then very you know true, yeah true. this is the thing tell me about your childhood yes yes let's talk about your story um, as opposed to the sugar that you consumed in the last <laughs> yeah. week but anyway i almost feel like um, you know in this kind of context it was ready for a crisis then there has been obviously there are politics now to clearly data and i think rajeshwari was alluding to this i think the two have just now concocted and created this complete storm right uh, where now there's like silence i mean there's barely any data coming out um i also think part of it is something we were discussing earlier which is that i think the level of scrutiny on the health of any metric because of social media because we are now there is a kind of polity which is far more interested in scrutinizing lots of things debating for good or for bad um as a consequence there's also a lot of fear around well what if we put things out which are just you know not there are issues which i have a feeling maybe in the past you could sort of test and experiment and learn and there were measures by the way for example when they were trying to measure women's informal work there were some measures that just did not work at all i have a feeling maybe if that happened now there would be such a set of storm and stories around it and given that politics now is so closely linked to the news cycle and how you're represented and image and all of that i think that's also making it worse um having said that though i do still think that in state governments planning departments which take the ownership particularly of collecting local data i think they are still very committed to the idea of at least collecting information because they have to put it in their state plans their state budgets and i think a lot of the data story amit is also related to the planning story because when the planning commission went and was replaced with what is the niti aayog now a lot of the fundamental where the data was going right in some of the decision making which was almost binding because you had to there were budget allocations that were done on it there were poverty estimations that were being done when all of that went some of the push in the system the almost you know like how in india everything happens in mission mode that mission mode in the system evaporated so i have a feeling part of it is also then the incentives in the system to get certain things done also started to recede so i think it's a combination of three but i wouldn't just put it on malice i think there is also there are genuine questions about bureaucratic reform not just i mean definitely in the statistical architecture but i think this is larger parts of the bureaucracy others on your show have talked about this and i think that meets malice and then you have the outcome that you do so i i largely agree with what shana said i think it's the answer is not as straightforward as saying it's either malice or incompetence right because for example if you just look at the gdp data it's an extremely complicated task to collect data and compute the gdp of a country and we are talking about the largest democracy of the world gdp collection process in india is an is a complete nightmare and and you have to remember that india was at the frontier of statistical data collection back in the 60s and 70s during the 
Mahalanobis, period, etc. And we were actually, uh, I mean, our advice, the advice of our statisticians was sought by the Western countries in order to build a statistical structure and system. So we were at that level. So we did something right. I mean, we definitely got that edifice, that statistical structure right. But I think what happened down the line is, and I agree completely with what Shana said here, is that we also needed to continuously reform the statistical bureaucracy. Like as we were reforming the country, as we were opening up the country, which became vastly more complex than the centrally planned closed economy of the 60s and 70s, we suddenly have a very complex modern market economy with a statist edifice uh, imposed on top of it. But we've somewhere down the line forgot to reform the statistical bureaucracy. We forgot to improve their capacity, strengthen their capacity with numbers, skill, quality, everything. So you have like a the same system that continued from the 60s and 70s, but you're now putting the pressure of computing the GDP of a significantly more complex economy. And you have the pressure of meeting international standards. In fact, the latest revision of GDP was done primarily to take India's GDP method to the international standards. You have that pressure as well. And there is increased scrutiny, exactly as Shana said, because now suddenly it's not just 10 statisticians sitting in ISA, Calcutta who have access to the data. There is everybody who has access to the data and everybody can ask questions about the data. So I think that the combination of that led to the crumbling of that edifice, so to speak. And then somewhere down the line, you know, you realize that you are in a secular stagnation for 10 years. Um, you were just not aware of it because you were looking at some other numbers or you just chose to be oblivious about it. And then suddenly a survey comes out which shows that consumption has like four decade low, unemployment is four decade high. What do you do about it? You suddenly, you don't have a coherent economic strategy. You don't have an economic policy or election is down the road. What do you do with it? So I wouldn't put it and malice, it's almost like a political compulsion. Don't release the survey because then we are going to look really bad. So I think it's a combination of everything. But the problem is that they probably could have addressed it by being a little bit more transparent and being a bit more proactive about taking steps to address the problem, which they did not do. And we kept waiting for when is the next consumption survey is going to happen? When are they going to fix the GDP problems? They just did not do it. So the silence on the part of the, the statistical organization is what I think compounded the problem even more, because by now it's been 2015 was when GDP data was released. 2017 was when the service was suppressed. We are in 2022 and we have not seen any steps being taken by them. Can I just add just two quick things? I mean, the reason the last PLFS was released was because essentially the statisticians went on strike. And I agree with Rajesh. I think we need to see more of this hartal culture perhaps in, in our statistical bureaucracy. Something that the bongs got right. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the second thing I want to actually say is, you know, what is actually a very exciting source of new data now is transaction data, uh, all kinds of data. That's We're all always exchanging data every day. Problem is we don't have a data privacy law yet. It's been debated till Adam in Parliament. I believe it's now again gone back and there's again JPC looking at it. If you don't even have a data privacy framework, then a lot of the other exciting parts of the data while we're waiting for government data to organize itself, even that you can't use one for... So forget service delivery. For example, I'll give you one example. You know, we're talking about welfare, right? One of the things everybody says countries like Brazil have done is you have a unified registry, right? Uh, where you say that, well, one household receives four benefits and I know, you know, what these benefits are. In India, number one, you can't even do that currently at the state or national level because you can't, there is no legal framework to protect the data and the movement of data, uh, you would think this is something that is absolutely fundamental. So one, not just for the delivery of basic goods and services, but also to understand what's happening to transactions and going back to what Rajeshri was saying about the, the micro constituents of macro variables. You could do a lot of exciting stuff, but where is the data privacy framework? So I just want to double down on what she said, but also say I think there are alternative sources of data available, but the use of them are very grey and nebulous because until we have laws in place we aren't also able to carefully use them. By the way, one data that I would definitely look forward to using going forward would be GST data. Because goods and services tax can be a very good alternative proxy to a GDP or an overall aggregate indicator to understanding how the economy is doing. And the more the government release it, releases it in a more transparent manner, more disaggregated manner, the better. So I would hope seriously that that continues and more disaggregated data comes out uh, because that is something that we can look at as an alternative proxy. 
In fact, one of the questions that came in on Twitter was from Sahil Khandwala, who said, "Quote: GST receipts crossed 140 crores in March 22. Does this mean GST is finally successfully implemented? Has it has a net positive effect on the economy?" I, I don't think it is. It is says much about the implementation of GST as much as it does about normalization of the economy after the pandemic. So you're basically seeing opening up of economic activity. You're just seeing a you know shutdowns and lockdowns are gone. The economy is back to sort of doing the activities that it's supposed to be doing, and therefore there's a revival of pent up demand. All of that is happening, and that's showing up in the GST data. I don't think it. I mean, it's difficult to disentangle the two, but I don't think it has got so much to do with the implementation of GST. Can I just add one thing? I, I hear a lot of people say to me, well, look at the GST numbers. They're just, at, 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 it's all so great. And I can see both of you are just giggling at this because I think all of us have heard it. One thing I will say to anyone, particularly young people listening to us, if you lead the GST numbers, great. Exactly as Rajeshwari said, look also at the employment, unemployment that's coming out of CMIE. I would almost force everyone. It's a, it's a, it's a practice. It should be good practice that once you look at GST, also look at the labor market. Because I think you have to look at the two of them in conjunction to understand what's happening. Because they do kind of, sometimes they give you a different picture, but I think it's useful. Just so that we don't get carried away sometimes with this, you know, the number that are being reported. And, and I'm also skeptical of any kind of tax collections going up because <laughs> taxes to me are a transfer from the productive part of the economy to the parasitic part of the economy. And on that Ouch. note, we shall take <laughs> a quick I don't break. think we can we can say the same about indirect taxes or sort of, you know, GST. But anyways, that's a different debate altogether. But I do agree that we have to look at multiple series. I think that's very clear by now. You can't put all your eggs in one basket and say just one series and we know how the economy is And, and I have to tell you, uh, I loved um, Shrena's phrase just now when she, when she spoke about how excited she is by micro constituents of macro variables. That's, uh, <laughs> you know, such uh, superb geekery. <laughs> Thank you, Amit. This is what you elicit in us. <laughs> On that note, we'll take a break. And when we come back, uh, we'll go much deeper into our Adda. Long before I was a podcaster, I was a writer. In fact, chances are that many of you first heard of me because of my blog, India Uncut, which was active between 2003 and 2009 and became somewhat popular at the time. I love the freedom the form gave me and I feel I was shaped by it in many ways. I exercise my writing muscle every day and was forced to think about many different things because I wrote about many different things. Well, that phase in my life ended for various reasons and now it is time to revive it. Only now, I'm doing it through a newsletter. I have started the India Uncut newsletter at indiauncut.substack.com where I will write regularly about whatever catches my fancy. I'll write about some of the themes I cover in this podcast and about much else. So please do head on over to indiauncut.substack.com and subscribe. It is free. Once you sign up, each new installment that I write will land up in your email inbox. You don't need to go anywhere. So subscribe now for free. The India Uncut newsletter at indiauncut.substack.com. Thank you. Welcome back to The Scene in the Unseen. I'm chatting with Rajeshwari and Shreyana. And uh, I had announced at the start of this episode that we, we're going to talk about Rajeshwari's life and so on and so forth. And well, niyat to achi thi, as Modi ji says. But <laughs> the situation we are in is that we have like an hour of talking left. And there are many things about the economy to discuss. And Rajeshwari has promised to come back at some point in time for a five or six hour episode uh, where we can go into deep detail uh, into her life, uh, you know, which is fascinating because uh, her family has a rich cultural history her uh, uh, her ancestors uh, in fact held the first uh, the Durga Puja in a particular first part big of Durga Puja in the city to in celebration to of celebrate Robert Clive's victory in the Battle of Plassey yeah so uh, patriots of existing regimes from a long time <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but so I'll, I'll I'm so relieved we are uh, not talking uh, about my life now. I, I think maybe this is a good tactical move yeah no no I really the, I don't want to rush through this because uh, I, I, I I think that uh, Rajeshwari has had a really interesting life and uh, it'll be great fun. So we shall save that for later. But meanwhile, uh, both of you mentioned that you had kind of questions for each other. 
so why don't we go with that and then we can go on to uh, whatever um, uh, you know we'll take some stuff from twitter and perhaps things will occur to me as well sure so i uh, had a question for shana i was listening to the podcast which i thoroughly loved um and i told you on the email as well that i really like the way you combine the bollywood pop culture with economics and labor market outcomes which i mean i would have never even thought about so the question that i had i guess was that so the, the way you are sort of you know the way sharukh khan enters into the book is basically the fact that he's sort of more much more of a feminist actor compared to the other actors of his generation not feminist in the him. sense that he, he's much more caring and his his views towards women and the way he deals with women is very different in parts from the of way his iconography. Parts of his iconography is different from the way the other big actors of his time would deal with and that is what makes women relate to him a lot more i guess than or rather become his fans much more than than others so basically you know i mean he 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 comes across as much more of a person that that women feel comfortable with or women feel that they they want that kind of a boyfriend or a husband who's going to be giving importance to them etc cetera, etc cetera. so i guess the, the doubt that i had which is just your doubt just as i was listening to the podcast is that is you're an armor fan is that no i'm not i'm not a I'm not a fan of anyone in bollywood per se oh, but it's um, even worse but basically I, th- i think the question that i had was that is isn't it fair to say that while sharukh i mean the the way he was in most of the portrayal of the roles that he did in the movies at the same time all the women actresses in his movies they didn't really have a lot to do per se and now hear me out when i let me finish this so what i'm trying to say is that even if you take an, a, a classic movie like ddlj right where it's true i mean the boy falls in love with girl and it's all very romantic and it's all very nice and is dealing with simran is also very nice and caring and loving and sweet and all of that but ultimately he is the one who does the entire job of convincing Simran's parents he's the one who goes all the way to India he's the one who's doing all the coating and convincing and you know all of that and while mm-hmm. the girl is just sitting demurely waiting for him to be done with whatever he's doing so that you know they can get together so she doesn't really have a whole lot of things to do in the second half of the movie and likewise for example if i think of either you know kal hona ho or all the other movies of that particular time period uh, kabhi kushi kabhi gham kuch kuch hota etc the the women don't really have a lot to do i mean i'm not talking about women having agency but i'm just saying that other than romancing or other than you know the romantic complications that entail in the movies there's not a whole lot that the women are actually doing in terms of you know do they have jobs what is their viewpoints uh, what is their choice across different men are they even exercising a choice what agency do they have etc and if i contrast that to, and maybe this was reflective of the way society was back then that we were liberalizing but we still had a lot of hangover of tradition. the past of tradition yeah. uh, women not really playing a very powerful role in society and family etc and if i contrast that to now for example i mean some of the movies that i have seen let's say vicky kaushal comes to mind oh God. um and no no i'm not talking about the person as you know whether i'm a fan or not but i'm just saying the roles that he essays so for example you you have a movie like manmarzia where there is a woman who has a choice between two men and he she exercises the choice to go with one and not the other or for example there is love per square foot where the the girl and the boy decide to get married because each of them wants to own a home whereas love and romance is not the reason for the marriage the girl has as much agency as the boy does um or for example even alia bhat movies like for example a highway where she chooses to stay with the abductor because she doesn't want to go back home and then when the abductor is killed she just abandons her own family and goes to the mountains and does her own business and builds a home which is tremendous amount of energy agency on part of a young girl again other examples so uh, i guess um, you know priyanka chopra in dil dhadakne do this movie that i have seen recently where she she gets a divorce and she manages the father's business which is again tremendous amount of agency on part of a woman and in fact the brother which is ranveer singh is being portrayed as a good for nothing so i think that's just a marked departure even ye jawani hai diwani i mean ranveer kapoor being a very oh God, lovey dovey boy but then deepika padukone film ever made uh, deepika padukone in that movie has a job i mean she's a medical student who's very good in her well, studies we don't ever see her working and- at least she has a role which is basically she has a role no, in a clinic no they all have jobs which is they compared all to studying. all the other women we we were seen in the sharukh khan no, movies but, but they're not doing no, anything but much. now i will so protest that's the actually yeah. factually that's incorrect because preeti zinta there's an how does she meet uh, saif ali khan in kalhona ho it's because she's studying to be a management student 
each one of the women, uh, Simran is probably actually the only one. And in fact, that's part of the big reason why a lot of the women who I interviewed said to me that, well, Simran can't live, her own, live on her own. So he better make sure that Simran's father supports the, the match. So actually, that's not true. Because if you look at a lot of his films, Swades, the teacher, her teaching is very prominent and important, in fact. And... Watch Swades to know that is not a woman who has no agency. Yeah, I've seen Swades, yeah. So look at Swades, Kalhuna as well. Because remember, it's actually she has a choice between Saif and Shah Rukh. She realizes Shah Rukh's not interested because he's married. She's going to marry Saif. She does a lot going on. Veer Zara as well. The reason she goes to India is but, because but, she wants fine, to... Fine, but you won't yeah, agree yeah, that the recent... The, there's been definitely I'll, I'll a transition. To the, I'll come yeah. to that in a yeah. second. So I think so that's one. So I think we should just retire the idea that the women don't have agency or don't have jobs because that's just statistically actually not true because in these movies his last film Zero is a remarkable film because it has a scientist or an actress who he is besotted with both of whom and they both just reject him and Amit and I were joking in fact during the last uh, podcast and you know the the rejection is literally made is made literal by the fact that he is vertically challenged or you know is 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 suffers from dwarfism and they say you don't measure up to me right um so i think that's one so i don't think that that's true and i also think agency is not just there's a kind of flatness to the visual medium. Agency is not just us having one dialogue saying, oh, the girl has a job. For example, Deepika Padukone in that Ye Javani, she is doing nothing but basically, in actually all of Ranbir Kapoor's films, the women do nothing but essentially be the supportive savior or the manic pixie dream girl. Or, and they are all they all at some point have a job. Like there's a, you know, there'll be someone doing something. But you never actually, their jobs don't necessarily intersect with the storyline per se. I think where things are actually very different is when women write films. So take Dear Zindagi, where actually the principal conflict is Shah Rukh is playing a therapist to Alia Bhatt trying to figure out what to do with her career and her personal life. She's very unhappy with the way her career is going. And it is up front center in that movie. And he in fact plays almost, he's like the supporting character to a film that is about her conflicts, right? So I think, I think just to say, I think actually the real axis of shift, I don't think isn't just the whether we have one dialogue or two dialogues where they go to office or they show her how much of a woman's ambition uh, to run an NGO, to run a magazine. So Preeti Zinta runs a magazine, by the way, in uh, Kabhi Alveda Na Kehna, the wife's career is actually the principal fault line in that Shah Rukh film because he is unable to handle her success. So again, going back to that idea, that women in his films definitely have career paths. And I think, you know, it's just, uh, just because, uh, but even with that, I don't particularly think it's a great portrayal of women. So I would never say that the women are portrayed like it lavishingly I well. I just feel that now increasingly women are, relatively speaking, definitely portrayed better so, than what it you was know, back I, then. I, I actually, here's the thing, I, and Paramita Vora actually recently did a piece about this and I, I completely agree with her. You know, I had done this thing where I measure how much women speak in film and someone in a newspaper had reported on this and they had interviewed Paramita and one of the things she actually said said and I think it really stayed with me is that she felt that visual mediums have become very gendered of late right and what that basically means is that there's this constant need to show that the woman is being portrayed well because there is this scrutinizing gaze going back to what we were talking about but it's almost like the ways you're fighting stereotypes are so stereotypical um, I don't think in fact other than a wonderful OTT show which is about a Delhi a police officer I'm forgetting the name of the show Delhi um, Crime well there's that but there's another one as well I'm yet to see or Luck by Chance actually is one of the best films I think to me when it comes to sort of women's agency job all of that right but you wouldn't agree there are increasingly more women centric scripts being written I think they're in very Bollywood. formulaic I think they're actually really boring to be honest I see some of the stuff and it's almost like you want to show a woman is empowered so there's some kind of like prototypical way a woman is empowered and I'm not sure I don't buy into it I, I don't, don't feel agree. the conflict I mean, like for example if you think of a Razi right I mean yes it's based on true story but and then also it was not it, typical it, it's, at all but 
but this but see this is where i go back to or a highway uh, no, for that no, matter no no yeah. but here's the thing i think each one of the cases that you're talking about and in fact this is something a lot of people have been writing about in feminism it's like women's stories are now only interesting when they're like heroes or they're victims so they have to like out and out do something really remarkable or be like you know really the sort of you know the brunt of a brutal crime and if you look at a lot of the women centric movies you know, that tend to come enough, but, out but, but let me finish that, yeah, let me finish yeah, 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 which yeah. is to say that i actually think the really interesting bargain texture is happening it's this missing middle of the narrative other than this police crime show i'm going to say there was other one there was gully boy where i thought alia bhat's role was like beautiful it was so well written uh, there are a few but i think actually the the factor here to me is not so much time i mean i think there were movies in the past that amol palekar was part of where the women were like writing journals and doing beautiful interesting things right um i don't think it's about time it's not like over time women's representation has become better i actually think it's about sometimes it's often about whether women write those scripts or not i often feel that when women write or direct there's a gaze in the way women are portrayed that presented which is much more open the con- like luck by chance at the end of the day is a woman is a is a very women centric film because it is you know very strong woman putting her voice out there so i see what you're saying but i think sometimes to me it feels very sort of oh hame dikhana hai ki there's a strong woman so we have these tropes of a strong woman and then we must show them and if you look at pink for example which i think is the worst crime possible on this it is a barney movie about women sexual violence but you have amitabh bachchan speaking through all of the film i mean the women barely have i think speaking. i think there are examples on the contrary as well i wouldn't say that all the women centric movies that are being made are primarily tra- i'm not a movie expert so i shouldn't go too deep into it so that i can't come out of it but at the same time i mean i just as an observer i don't think that most of the women centric movies that are being made are to show them just as either very powerful heroes or as victims and i think i think at some point i guess also what i'm trying to say is that I would be very happy that the era of a superstar is over that we are never going to have another Shah Rukh Khan because now then there is a scope to experiment with different kind of scripts and possibilities as opposed to just getting sort of overshadowed by this larger than life But persona. You know, I I don't know let me push back against that and this is the last thing I'll say on this which is that I don't know I think there's actually something very beautiful when our superstars are not our politicians. uh when our superstars are in cricket when our superstars are in culture when our superstars are um in in the creative arts i think right now we are living by the way in a culture where we have superstars we need it's a just, podcasting superstar yeah well hmm we are hmm. looking at who one is, who is that hmm i'm getting different responses yeah. from you guys hmm, go ahead hai, please finish i'm looking at you ha yeah. kaun ho sakta hai but I, so to me actually i think the really interesting question is not whether I don't see it as a zero sum game. I actually think you can have icons who are like really larger than life and people can derive I am not in the business of judging others for their pleasures. That's not my interest at all. Uh if you know seeing a big icon makes people happy as long as you're not out there lynching people, that's fine. Um if you want to see very complex scripts and all of that, that's great as well. I think there's like enough space now. for all kinds of mediums and stories but i will say one thing though i think the world where we think that everyone is watching ott and the world of like big superstars that's a really small space um in fact most people are watching ajay devgan's new film or uh you know it, it, there are big stars and in fact those stars have become so hideously masculine if you look at the roles akshay kumar ajay devgan and many of these films look at simba which came out which was about a policeman aggressively masculine in fact there was a tweet recently which said the only person who can save masculinity in bollywood is sharukh khan i completely believe that and i think that uh, you can have that um and you can also have these other stories that you're talking about and then you and i can disagree about whether we like them whether we connect with them that's a different Fair story enough. so i mean i mean this yeah. is your cue to ask the more important this questions this is my cue to move on from uh, sharukh khan but i can't help oh. but uh, sort of <laughs> say two things uh, and one is something that i mentioned in my episode with her as well that let us not forget that that film you mentioned ends with uh, amrish puri i think it was ja so, ja simran ji yes but yeah. please everybody so, read my book to know that that should sure. be interpreted in a very different way yeah but i interpreted 
it is yeah, she has no agency movie, i interpret like, it is exactly the same you way. know what simran should do simran should leave the dad leave the naka boyfriend he's and just go build boyfriend. a life on no, her no, own he's not a naka and boyfriend what, what really irritated me is that that scene became like a legend of sorts right and yeah, then we yeah. saw movies after movies and yeah. real life scenarios ads what have you made trying to but, but, it, but, move on, to but move on. let's move on to economics no no but yeah. no actually going back i want to actually oh, pick God. up on economics no okay. but here's the thing which is that uh in fact we live in a world and i can look at that scene and basically say that i judge it for not being feminist she has no agency she's in rural punjab she has no job of her own um at the end of the day i think what's happening is that you know there is a willful acceptance of your constraints and so we can disagree with that but it is also it is reality so we'll move on and yeah. uh, since you mentioned dear zindagi i uh, wrote about it in 2016 when it came out and i just want to read out a few lines f- uh, uh, from it for our friend here oh, uh, oh, uh, uh, so a number of points and i'll read out two of them and point number 2 was practically everything shahrukh khan's character says is nonsense oh. 90% of it is banal like ravi shastri talking about cricket and the other 10% is downright wrong and dangerous like modi talking about economics the kind of psychotherapy he's shown doing is basically quackery and the way he talks you'd imagine he's never read a book in his life and spends 20 minutes each week on brainy quotes in wikipedia simply put the guy's a buffoon this is his character he's mind he's been you. written let me continue huh? yeah and point <laughs> you're so upset point huh? number 3 no no i just want to say these because i'm just looking at your face as i say them But right, in the distance i wish i wish there was a video of this now yeah. i'm just audio point number 3 I have often maintained that Shahrukh Khan is the worst actor in history. I know Amitabh was his idol when he entered the industry and while Amitabh has done some monumental hamming in his time, Shahrukh knocks him out of the park. Uh, watching Shahrukh ham it up in scenes with the wonderfully naturalistic Alia is as painful as watching Amitabh ham it up in Piku in scenes with the brilliant Irfan Khan. Is the contrast not obvious to viewers? Am I the only one cringing? Stop quote. You 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 were one of the minority cringing I, I that you know. That. Yeah, yes. we talked about it. Here it's a majority. No, no, but this in is this like room, it's a Yeah, this, but no. But I, I think that, yeah, Ramit, you've discussed this I before. I think let's move on. No, let's no, 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 no. I don't no, want no. to move on. I no, don't we, want to spend like a minute. No, you can't like throw these quotes and say these things about the most wonderful person in our country and then say all this. He is to me one of the most wonderful people in the country. He has such a huge, um, even though scenes. you and I, you can debate whether you know the psychotherapy that is being there is a sense of cocoon and comfort that i know so many women who deal with like really terrible workplaces watch that film and i we've talked about it and i mentioned this in the book they walked out of that film feeling really encouraged and comforted you know especially the thing that he says about the kursi you remember in that film that you can explore different sexual possibilities and don't feel like you need to judge yourself for it it can sound like quackery but actually in our country where no one is actually talking about sex openly it felt very it was actually very comforting to a lot of women and i think you we, we can sort of judge people based on certain norms or what we think you know the script is acting is all of that but i do think we have to acknowledge that these people are playing very different functions so i just i want to say that okay, and, you, and he's great had the last word on sharuk ha uh, and now we uh, you had a question for uh, rajeshwari as well yes i actually want to know a bit about what what do you still enjoy being an economist i know we we started by saying we were having this conversation about the profession when you entered the profession that were there things that you really loved about the subject and has that sort of kept you going or do you think now you're a different kind of economist than you had thought when you had entered the field you would be i just want to get a sense of i know that you'll come back for an episode on your back life story but i want to know a bit more about your interest in the field and and how that's you Sure um so uh, first of all to answer that that first question i absolutely love being an economist even today and my sense is i'll continue to love being that for the foreseeable future because for me it's almost like combining passion with profession um so <clears throat> i think this i had briefly mentioned in the first episode with amit as well that when i was studying economics i didn't really think of myself as an economist of course far from it i didn't even know what i was going to become you know i was sort of in the rigmarole of the indian rat race or whatever you call it that i was going from one step to the other i was doing my graduation post graduation and i think when i was doing my post grad at some point of course i started realizing that i do like the subject for what it is um and this was also the time when india had 
liberalized, right? This was early 2000s and it was completely like the way I call it, like roaring 2000s in India. And mind you, I had I, I was coming from Calcutta, which was the communist bastion. And there, of course, any sign of liberalization, privatization was significantly more muted. Um, and But to the extent that I was witnessing it, it was a delight for me because you, when you're born in the 80s and you witness that, you actually live through the transition of it in, re in real life. And then I went to Delhi for my postgrad. And of course, Delhi was like an eye-opener. It was a culture shock and an eye-opener both at the same time. And and then when I was studying my postgrad, I, I think my love for economics had started in Presidency College when I was doing my undergrad. When I went to Delhi, I was massively disillusioned because in Delhi, everything was extremely competitive. It was about getting a job. It was about, you know, showing off what your salary is and all of that thing. And that was exactly not what I had in mind when I was sitting in Presidency College Library and idealizing about books and stuff and whatnot. And therefore, I had that period of disillusionment and I, I actually went to the corporate world. It was also fear of missing out. All my friends were doing it. I wanted to do it as well. So I went to the corporate world. I did not like it at all. Um, and that's when I think that hankering back to what I had felt during my undergrad studies in presidency came back. And I, I realized that let me give it a shot and let me actually try my hand at research and see if I'm really cut out for it, if I'm going to do it. And I think that's when I finally seriously started thinking of economics as a profession, as a calling. Um, and then I went to the US to do my PhD. But even throughout the US, it was again learning about what we call, talked about in the beginning of the episode, learning about the theories, the models. You're basically going through the entire program of it. And while I was still doing research, it was very mechanical, right? Because I wanted to get a PhD. I wanted to get some papers out. So I, w I was okay. I was doing fine. But I wasn't particularly the passion for economics and all of that. I, I didn't really feel it per se. And then I came back to India. And later on, we can talk about in different episode why, what, when. And when I came back to India, the, the funny thing that happened was that I actually had to leave India, go to the US and come back to India and do all of that journey to finally become an economist and think of myself as an economist. And I started sort of like feeling the juice of the subject, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, because when I came back to India, I came to IGIDR in Bombay and I met a wonderful bunch of people, two of whom are going to be here later on in the evening. Um, and they completely changed the way I think about economics, the way I wanted to apply economics. I was in that zone where like my PhD advisor, I would write papers, get published in the journal, you know, be a university academic economist. Mm -hmm. That 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 myth was completely dispelled when I met this bunch of people and I realized that economics can be a lot more fun than that. It can be a lot more, it can be made a lot more accessible to people than that. And I can have a lot more fun by studying the backyard, which is the Indian economy. Mm -hmm. uh, because until then, I hadn't thought of Indian economy at all, right? Because in my mind, it was the American university working on economic theories, being at the frontier of research. And for the first time, I rem strictly, exactly remember 2014 was the year when I started thinking that I, I, I might do some work on Indian economy. It will not get published in journals because nobody's interested in Indian economy. Um, I will never get a job abroad again because it's macro. Who's interested in Indian macro? And I was fine with all the trade-offs. So it was the decision that, that I had to take, that I was fine with these trade-offs because what what lies on offer for me was very, very exciting. And that's when I got involved in the drafting of the bankruptcy law. Now, for an economist trained in the US, if you were to tell me seven years or eight years back before that, that I was going to be involved in the drafting of a law, I would have thought, you know, what are you kidding about? I mean, m my friend economists in the US have no idea about how laws are drafted, etc. But I got involved in the drafting of the IBC, which was the most exciting, exhilarating experience ever mm -hmm. till date. I mean, for five months, we would just think, l breathe bankruptcy laws, which was not even my area per se, right? But I started understanding how Indian economy works, how different vested interests work. And that's basically the start of my journey as an economist. So it's as recent as that. And then since then, I've just been focusing on India. And as I said, you know, it doesn't get me a lot of top journal publications. It, it will never get me a job outside India if I ever want to go outside anywhere. Um, but the satisfaction is, is enormous. My friends who are economists in the U.S. would not even uh, remotely come close to the idea of drafting a law because they are just so far away from the policy and the legal space of it. Whereas what happened with me was that I got to know a whole bunch of very interesting lawyers, policymakers, 
no academic economist, so to speak, what is called mainstream academic economist. And it was a whole lot of fun. I mean, I was basically just having fun. I was called by the JPC in the parliament to depose. I mean, I was in a completely different world from what I had visualized when I started my PhD. And then I, I just fell in love with it. I just fell in love with the idea of understanding Indian economy, uh, giving it back to the best possible way that I can, which is through teaching my students, writing in the media, doing a whole lot of talk shows, uh, panel discussions. So I just make myself available whenever I get an invitation because that's my way of getting my own concepts right yeah. and also getting the concepts accessible to whoever is listening out. So I think I've had a complete ball of a time since 2015 and knock on wood and and I, I hope I anticipate that that's going to continue going forward. And as I said, this is nothing the way I had visualized mainstream economics was going to be. And to a large extent, the credit lies to the people that I got to know in 2014, 2015, who were tremendous influences in my life. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm just having a whole lot of fun at this point of time. Although everything at the economy has gone down south since then, but just analyzing it and mind you, I mean, before 2014, I didn't even think of the Indian economy per se, right? And now... I'm really into understanding what's happening, what's going on, how can I do better, how can I teach my students better, what articles can I write in lay English layperson's language so that people can understand. And uh, it's it's challenging, it's it's exciting. So yeah, I, I really like it. So yeah, it's definitely not The Economist. I never had a vision of myself as an economist. When I went to the US, I thought I was going to be one of those tenure track university yeah, professors. Yeah. I'm so glad and relieved that I came back and tremendously grateful to the people who have influenced me. Um, and I think I'm just very, very fortunate from that perspective. And what, what kind of strikes me is that, you know, that uh, uh, incident you narrated at the start of this episode, that you're out there in the slush going towards the water and the sky is getting dark and you don't know whether you'll reach the water and you don't know whether you'll make it back. And it seems like such a great metaphor for what you're just talking about. Because I also kind of feel like that sometimes. That sometimes you feel alone on the journey, but there's great beauty and you want to do it and you're doing it and you don't know where it's going to go and eventually you'll probably drown. And, and it's also, by the way, very, very, I, I don't know about the last part, but, it, but it's very risky, right? Because you're not getting yes. a huge monetary reward out yes. of it, right? Uh, you're not getting any tangible reward and benefit for that matter. You are entirely thriving on your own motivation and mental satisfaction and to yeah. go on year after year just based on that but touch wood as of now it's working well. I hope it continues to work well but who knows one fine day I'll just wake up and think what am I doing with my life but as of now I think it's working well. And I want to riff off something Shrena said in her last episode with me where you said something to the effect of numbers or elegant equations or whatever can move you to tears yes. right and I was struck by that because I sometimes feel that way, not so much about economics per se, but about figuring out a part of the world. Yep. You know, yeah, there's something that's muddy and suddenly it opens up and you see it clearly. It's like something that is pixelated suddenly becomes high definition. Yes. You know, uh, young Indian men, young Indian adolescent men of the 90s will remember this when they were downloading porn from dial-up connections. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know. What why. an analogy. That thank you, thank you for sense. taking us there, Amit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> apologies. But I want to uh, mention but, one hmm. thing, Amit, is that what I also realized is that it takes a very 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 long time to understand even a small part of Absolutely. economics yeah. I mean forget about the vast Indian economy yeah. right I mean I think I've spent seven years just trying to understand monetary policy or inflation right mm -hmm. and today I can at least write some meaningful coherent articles explaining that let's say to my mother or, or a common person and I'm fairly confident I'll do a very good job of that but that's just a really small percentage of the vast subject that economics yeah. is yeah. so it takes you have to basically devote your life to something like this to be able to say at the fag end that maybe I have a little bit of an expertise or maybe I have a little bit of a specialization and therefore people who call themselves experts I, I, I get very skeptical about those kind of claims because you have to be very, very focused and hardworking for a very long time to gain even a little bit of expertise yeah. in any subject. And, and focusing on Indian economy, I think, has given me that concentration that there's just one thing I'm doing and I just want to do it really well. You know, and I have to just, it's funny, I was listening to Rajesh Shri and I just, and I just realized one thing I wanted to just say is that often I, in fact, of late, 
I really find myself also dealing with somewhat of an imposter syndrome because there is this thing about like do you really have the ability to what can you on what basis are you making claims right many people will ask you questions and I'm like okay so this is what I think and sometimes I wonder is it tied up with my gender is it also tied up with the nature of economics exactly what you said which is that I know that even to understand employment rates it's taken us such a long period of time to construct them to understand them even now there are fast sets of it that i would you know not understand and so what's happened now sometimes to me is you know often for example for the book i'm asked lots of questions or even you know with my job people ask and you have to obviously speak with a certain amount of confidence assurance and of course i know my stuff but sometimes even at that same time there's this part of me that's thinking oh this is a little bit imposterish because do you really know you know and you're always dealing with these two voices so i i hear you but i also sometimes then feel that my battle often is to not shy away from my own argument which is to have the conviction to say this is what i believe i'm com- like for example we were fighting about shah rukh khan right now just as an example i believe x he's not an economic concept but i'm just using that i believe x we may disagree and that's fine i think sometimes the and all of us are kind of i think amit going back to what you had said during our last episode which has really stayed with me all of us are winging it right we all come at it with our own base of evidence our own insights our own biases our own back stories and i think what sometimes the main thing i think that troubles me about sometimes the state of conversation is that we should all be okay with saying that we're all kind of winging it and you only know as much and it's okay to then also be wrong and to update beliefs like this the, the fact that the world is bayesian the world should be bayesian we should all be updating our beliefs that to me is if there is one economic and statistical construct which i think is so important in our lives especially the way the modern world is just constantly changing it is this idea of bayesian you know probability which is that you should be constantly updating your priors and um, i i i think so for me i i i completely echo what i think rajeshri was saying but i also feel that in my own self i find that i really struggle with this part imposter syndrome and then sometimes i get angry because then you're always in a room and i'm sure this has happened to you rajeshri you're always in a room with lots of men and men also have their imposter syndrome but they deal with it by being even more know it all they're very good at dealing with it exactly and then i feel like i need to be even more aggressive and there's this like escalation of aggression and i i think i'm at this stage in my career where I, it's not so much just a technical journey but it's also just a psychological journey of like how do you now take what you know which you've built you know a long period of years investing in building nurturing and then engage with the world in a way which is still respectful and not this sort of you know constant fight so i'll say two things here so remember amit during the course of this conversation before the break you said that economics is about understanding the behavior of people right and therefore we should be able to interpret and analyze that and put it in simple language but it's very very hard right i mean i mean to reach the stage where you can analyze the behavior of people in simple terms and to put it and express it even simpler terms that takes years to reach that kind of confidence and that you have the grasp over the basic concepts and intuition and the interconnections to say okay i can now say this right so uh, it's a it's a very good thick quality that we should all have and we should aspire to do but what i'm trying to say is that it's a very long process i mean you can't just become an economist and get trained and start doing that right you have to to build years of expertise and knowledge and 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 it's good that if you if you sort of try to focus on that and the other thing that i will try to say is that i think i was always very conscious about the fact that i am entering into a male dominated profession and somewhere down the line that was a very very important factor in my mind um, and again much of this will come when we talk about my life back story but i i became even more conscious of it when i came back to india because in india i realized there are two things that you fight against as an aspiring economist one is your gender and the other is your age right yeah. you are never taken seriously particularly in policy circles unless you are of a certain age you have graying hair and all of that i mean before that people won't even take you seriously in whatever you are saying no matter how well you know the concepts etc and on top of that if you're a woman so if you're a young woman recently returned from the us there is no possibility that anybody is going to take you seriously so i had to struggle and now of course i mean i'm i'm not even there yet i'm still in the midway but i had to struggle a lot to make my voice 
voice heard, even as something like a panel discussion where everybody else would yeah. be a man. And I'm just struggling to make my voice heard on one particular question where they're all just being very aggressive and their body language is very different. So you're fighting at multiple levels. You're trying to understand the subject. You're trying to understand what's happening in the economy. And you're trying to sort of be the lone female voice in a room full of men. You also don't want to look that you're being overshadowed by them. Um, so it's it's a constant struggle. And out of all of that, if you get one output ready where you can say, okay, I've understood this slice of the world, I think that's a tremendous achievement. And that's what I pat, pat myself at the back. You know, in fact, I have to just say, in fact, now my goal when I go into a room and it's it sounds, is actually I'm very comfortable being overshadowed because then I often know that maybe I've learned a lot about male psychology, modes of behavior, and I know it's material for my next book. You know, and, that's uh, a good way of looking yeah, that, at it. That's the way I now learn to deal with it because, you know, in life, I've just, especially in this field, because you do have type, there's a kind of person who enters this arena of the world, right? Uh, in somewhat type A, fairly ambitious. Everybody's really bright. Everyone, you know, is coming at it with their own good intentions. And so with that, there's always going to be this elbowing. There'll be a lot. There's a lot of status jockeying. That's just, you know, the thing that's part of life. And now I've actually, I think my way of handling it is to just almost say, there was a time, in fact, I was the exact opposite. I would want to just, you know, I want to like be, you know, this thing, I need to be heard. And But I learned, in fact, I'll just share this story. Uh, one of the first bureaucrats I ever worked with, and he who shall definitely not be named, used to not even look at me and he'd look at my male colleagues and then the question would come to me, but through my male colleagues. And in fact, the same chap once I had walked into a room on my own and he just kept looking behind me at the door and he said, World Bank, kaha hai? And Wow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Now, cut to, it's been it was nearly seven years, seven, eight years. Um, he's, I know where, where he, he's going through a really difficult time because there are lots of really powerful women in the service and he has to deal with the fact that, you know, there are more and more women coming in to positions of authority and are also in think tanks and and I can see him struggling. And so I, I've sort of learned to, I used to get really angry and maybe I should still get angry, but I think I've also learned that Perhaps this is where creativity and humor and all of that really helps, right? Because you just have to be able to just wear it a bit lightly or else it just becomes, it, yeah. it can just be exhausting. I, I think I think you're right that I think the, 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 the male economists, and since that's the only profession I know, it's a struggle for them too. Right. Yeah. I mean, they are used to a traditional world where it's just them. Right. And suddenly you see these women walking into the room who are equally, if not more competent. They also have a voice. They're aggressive. They want to speak up. How do you deal with that kind of a two genders in the same room? I think men struggle a lot more than women. That's been my experience. I'd actually cut my men a little less slack yeah. than you're cutting them. <laughs> because I think I, I, I think it's actually a welcome uh, sort of is welcome growth. Uh, yeah. You know, the of men course, should yes. welcome looking, you know, being able but to... But it ex- doesn't happen that way. No, and another thing that... <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there should then, be a segue side episode, which we will not record. Yeah, where we no, will no, discuss no, stories. we can do another five-hour episode on this. But one thing that strikes me from what both of you are saying, which is very poignant, and this is something I've noticed for every single female guest who's come on this show, is that to get to wherever they are, they've had to jump more hoops than any man who would have to. Like just being conscious all the time like in a sense men can be like feral animals not even be aware of the impulses and what they how their egos are making them behave and they're just going through all of those uh, motions but b- b- women have to be constantly aware of these dynamics that why do I get interrupted yeah. all the time why do I get talked down on and you have to come in past fact, I mean, that I've even had the opposite experience where I have been invited to events because they wanted to have a woman oh, on stage I, I, right? I mean this. it's yes. just like you go from one extreme where you are genuinely invited maybe because you're good but then you enter a room full of 40 men and you have to be loud and aggressive otherwise you can't be heard to the other extreme where you're invited only because they need to have a woman on stage doesn't matter what your merit and what your arguments are and what you do in that kind of a forum do I turn it down do I show up what do I do so it's like you're jostling these two different extremes and while in the middle you're just trying to figure your own shit out basically I also think a lot of it is you know women are socialized also to just constantly be aware of the gaze of everyone 
in the room and even gave that doesn't Absolutely. exist um i definitely have had moments when i have thought that male colleagues of mine are looking down on my argument when actually later i realized that that was not true at all right and and when yeah, i talk to program to think like that exactly yeah. and whereas yeah. if you talk to men they are not they haven't internalized the gaze of the other to that extent maybe it's just the boss right but i will also i'll agree with you amit on one thing which is that i do i i hear what rajeshwari is saying and i've seen this men are struggling as well we have a crisis of masculinity it's in all professions but i i agree with which is that the less like i give is sometimes it really irritates me and i see this now a lot but with more and more women entering the kinds of things that are said behind in the sort of there is still a locker room right even amongst economists there is locker room talk boys who work at think there are things that are said it's a said. typical thing right if a female economist has made a good name for herself there must be something to it exactly. like who's the male who's supporting her or who yes. she's sleeping with as brazen as that yeah, right yeah. i mean there is something more to it than just her success as an economist Absolutely. but if it's a male economist of huh. course i mean come on huh. he's just brilliant yeah. he's hard working yeah. right who'd sleep with them yeah, anyway yeah exactly <laughs> those those adjectives are not applied to the woman at the first brush and you just know it and at some point you just brush it off and say you know what i don't care yeah exactly. I mean, Exactly. I honestly don't care what you're going to say about me because you're going to say nevertheless. Yeah. So I'll just do what I want to do and for, for whatever you want to talk keep talking. Yeah. So I think at some point I think we develop a very thick skin and you know and that's the only way to survive and do well and now I don't even notice the men in the room. Right? I mean they are all like they are all people they are there I do my job they do their yeah. job and I'm out of it. I mean, I mean that, that I've reached that stage at least and and, and I'm happy about that. No, I I do notice the. I think I'm still at this phase. I do have to deal with that gaze. It it does bother me. The back the back talk also bothers me because one here the one thing about of course this is I don't know what Bombay is like, but in Delhi people only say mean things about you to strangers because they know that you will hear them eventually. Like it just circles back, right? Like the world is small. Um, and so of course it bothers one. But I I've now also realized that I have to just acknowledge exactly what. Rajesh Ravi was saying which is that it is part of a big social shift that i think the profession men and women are going through so i may be part of the generation that just has to deal with some of the fallout of it and that's fine because you know I, i so much is otherwise is going well but there is this psychological nonsense that you're dealing with along with having to be technically proficient which i do think that at least men in the profession i don't think face as much and let's hope that changes i think i think the scrutiny that we are subjected to is a lot higher yeah um, you yeah. have to prove your metal a lot harder and a lot more but i love shrena's way of dealing with it which is i'm going to put it in my next book exactly. which is great i can't wait exactly. for your next book yeah absolutely uh, yeah so we have like 15 minutes left before shrena's got to go uh, to the stop secret meeting so we'll just rush through uh, some broad questions and when i say rush through let's rush through them because people have a, and these are kind of big issues and one is i have a question for each of you on inflation so rajeshwari you're the macro person and my question there is that everybody wants to know what's causing it and what can be done and so on and so forth Okay so is there a potted answer to this or is it too complicated <laughs> I mean okay let me try to cut it really short and not give a very uh, longish answer so what's causing it the lot of supply chain constraints right so the supply side has gotten completely messed up one because of the pandemic now because of the Russia Ukraine war we import oil crude oil edible oil fertilizer all the major items that we import the prices have gone up globally so we are basically importing that high inflation um and also the china lockdowns because of the resurgence of the pandemic that is further squeezing the supply chain so it's a supply side related so inflation happens when when demand is greater than the supply now demand is weak and supply is even weaker so that is creating the situation of excess demand which is pushing prices up as simple as that so it's basically the supply side constraints that's causing inflation and how it is going to go away well there has to be some waking up required on the part of the reserve bank of india to understand that inflation control is ultimately their job and they need to go back to the table to do their job is basically as simple as that but in reality of course they're far from it because they have they are dealing with multiple objectives this complete lack of central bank independence etc all of that is going on but bottom line is you have to use monetary policy to deal with inflation and that's not getting done and my question for shrena actually comes from shruti rajgopalan because she the moment i said on twitter that uh, uh, i'm chatting with two economists she immediately replied who are these economists and i was like they're both friends of yours don't worry so uh, the, the her question for you is uh, and it's a great question which is how does inflation impact men and women differently 
Oh gosh, that is a very good question. So a couple of things. One is, uh, well, if you look at intra-household distribution, because one thing we know, right, bargaining theory, intra-household bargaining theory teaches us that if prices go up or household aggregate consumption indicators because of price amount is impacted, essentially women's access to goods within the household always becomes lower. So nutrition outcomes could be affected if you start to reduce consumption of goods, consumption of oil, consumption of basic food baskets. There's a nutritional aspect to it, which is very much happening. We're not yet seeing like core evidence on it, but anecdotally and certainly in research that's coming out of journalists, you're picking this up, right? So that's one. So anytime household resources are squeezed because of gender norms within the household, women eat less, women consume less. Investment in also women's human capital may start to reduce because you need to offset the increase in price, right? So the way you do that is you manage the amount that is being consumed by female members of the families. That's one. So there's an impact on nutrition and health, human capital, all of that. The other, which is I think more worrying, is sometimes families respond to increases in prices, particularly now since we're looking at transport prices being impacted, which I think is a very big and important section, is that anyway, as we know, families are reluctant to let women travel out or let them use money to essentially access the world outside. The moment you now have a world in which those prices are going further up. Unsurprisingly, the reluctance is only going to now find an excuse. So almost patriarchy will find an excuse in prices. I think that's the best way to put it, right? Uh, which is to say, well, now, you know, it's just become so expensive. Like, right? Let the boy go. Let him handle all the dealings with the world outside in one travel out, right? I'm, I'm keeping this really micro and very simple just for people even who don't come from an econ background to understand. And then you basically say, well, let the boy go. He can do, you know, household marketing, anything else he needs to do, you don't necessarily need to go to. Th so there are fears that feminist economists have had that inflation actually leads to reduced mobility outcomes often for women as well. For men, it's far more straightforward, right? Uh, it is actually, of course, an impact on income, impact on savings, all kinds of insurance behavior as well is impacted. Uh, your labor market decisions about how you work, where you work, all of that would be impacted as well. But I think Shruti's question, which is I think why she always asks these really good questions, is also to get us to think that this is why you need a feminist lens to economics. Because if you were to just look, and I think Rajeshri will agree with me, if you were to just look at the impact on inflation, much like medicine, where a lot of the uh, experiments on for drugs are done on men's bodies and then you report results saying that this works for women also. Actually, a lot of these channels uh, work very differently based on norms, right? Gender is a good example of that because it's such a strong norm here. Uh, so I would, I think the answer to her question is that because of intra-household bargains, I would anticipate, theory would suggest that consumption of core goods, investment in human capital and mobility outcomes would be impacted. Data has not yet been fully tracked, but we do know that when this happens, you do tend to see some of these, but in the realm of correlation. Um, and the last thing I will say here is that uh, Another thing that does happen often is that the reliance on welfare increases, particularly for women. I think going back to what we were talking about. Also what happens rations. is reliance on gold increases. Yes. So buying of gold jewellery goes up significantly when inflation is high and volatile. And that is uh, something that is very damaging for the economy because you're essentially taking the savings out of the formal sector. Uh, and we see that always happen in India. No, and you mentioned the feminist lens on economics. I remember one of my past guests, Minal Pandey, when I was editing this policy magazine, Pragati had once uh, written a piece for me about in the context of agriculture, but it's true in any other context, is that it's typical to talk about the agricultural uh, problem with Indian agriculture in a particular way. But if you look deeper, you go one layer deeper, there's, there's women in Indian agriculture, and that's a much worse problem. And similarly, you look at literally any issue in India, and you, you know, you look far enough, you'll find that there's another layer and there are the women there and they're not being spoken about. And it's just, it's almost like it's but one you know, I mean, homogenous. The problem is that just as we were discussing, just, just as no one cares about how why women's LFPR is so low, no one cares about how inflation is going to impact women from a policymaker's perspective. This because so true. it's just like a complete non-existent section of the population. Why would women be impacted by inflation? What about women jobs, right? So it's not even in the discourse. I mean, here it's a really small minority 
minority yeah. that is discussing it but if you go out there and if you even talk to a central bank or if you talk to the policy makers i mean they'll just give you a look and say what are you even talking about yeah. i mean why should we even worry about these things you know and in fact it, what i find most insulting is often when this question is asked and you know during budget conversations what is the gharelu budget how will the housewife react to the budget you know how so inflation often in fact the way i just answered it typically when on in news rooms and i think rajeshwari is rigorously nodding her head in yes when you discuss inflation for women there is a discussion but it is this steeped in you know masculinist models of the economy where the impact on inflation is only on how wives have to cut corners to you know manage the household budget but actually we live in a country when there is inflation wives consumption uh, is going to reduce that we often don't talk about right i don't know i really one thing i just want to echo i completely i think no one i don't know but no one cares because we hear a lot of lip service these schemes for women all of that i think it's in the realm of lip service but actually getting into the granularities of you know i've often now said markets don't like single women in particular look at the housing market credit markets instruments that are out there i don't see i would love for the ministry of women and child to say you know what we're going to set up at least a commission or something to look at how do we make some of these markets more friendly for single women because you don't have a dual income you're still often supporting families your your own elderly it's completely non existent it's non existent and yet actually we are entering a world where more and more women like myself are going to be single for longer periods of time uh we are dealing with markets and these markets are actually core to the jobs crisis because you're not going to solve the jobs crisis without attacking the housing and credit markets in fact as well. i'll tell you that you know if the whole idea of financial planning for yourself that is completely non existent in the women's realm i mean you wouldn't see financial advisors talking to women and giving them advice on how do you plan your pension insurance etc because the entire discussion is very head of the family centric and that's obviously very male centric but what if i as a woman irrespective of whether i'm single or married i want to do my own financial planning build my own financial portfolio where is the advice for me yeah. and that is just so difficult to find because no no wait it has to be in conjunction with yes. the head of the household and it has to be a family planning it cannot be an individualistic single woman or whatever married woman planning so i think this this is going to take decades to even reach a stage where we can see any change happen i think there's a lot to think about in everything both of you said the only part i will disagree with is i don't think a ministry setting up a commission is going to help anything <laughs> that I mean, yeah, that mean, yeah this is my dilli pana coming out but here's <laughs> the thing then we're back we're back to the status yeah but thing. but i do but what I, i i'm using that it could be anything look but i really think we need an instrument that's it yeah 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 no uh, it's a big problem it has to be solved but ministry and commission <laughs> are not going. so we've got 5 minutes left there are tons of great questions so i just want to apologize to people who took the trouble to put these in twitter and say look i'm so sorry uh, some fantastic questions really uh, we'll in, come in back fact, again we will yeah, come back exactly so you'll come back again and we'll get to ask them so i'll end with this one last question and i really like the way it was framed uh, and it's interesting which is it's is from a gentleman named das whose twitter id is at kitchen camp prof and he asks what is the cost of happiness is it trending up or down or sunk maybe you can answer this in a personal way if you can't give a generalized answer obviously so But say the question is what is the cost of happiness what is the cost of happiness is it trending up or down it's trending up it's trending up because uh the costs of well first just the financial costs of seeking pleasure stability economic the first layer of happiness is some amount of stability and assurance those we were just talking about inflation that's trending up right uh it's trending up also because our social institutions and our political institutions are discourses such that to even voice voice is a second layer of happiness the cost of voice is very high nowadays we all know it um and the third reason i think it's also trending up is when you have conservative turns in societies like we are going through often happiness requires taking risks and saying things that may be misunderstood and i think now the costs of being misunderstood are very high so i think to me it's it's trending up so i would say once again i can't help think of the gender here right and and i'm going to think exclusively from the female lens I think definitely the cost is going up because the cost of happiness going up means that in order to do something that makes you happy what are the obstacles that you're facing and I think increasingly if I'm redefining my happiness as something that I want to go out in the world I want to make a career for myself I want to earn my own money and I want to step into the male dominated profession of course I am encountering obstacle after obstacle and to that extent 
that cost of my happiness is of course going up now if i compare that with let's say a previous generation who were defining happiness differently that i'm just going to stay at home look after my there's nothing wrong in it i'm just saying the choice set may have changed and the more we are getting more ambitious the more we want to be empowered the more we are paying a cost for it because we are encountering more and more obstacles uh, so i think definitely and it's going to continue to trend up gosh i hate this we entered on a pessimistic note where i put it say it's pessimistic no. no i mean but but it's a cost that all of us are many of us are bearing yeah and, i think and that's we are, and the, we're okay yeah. to bear the cost exactly. right we are not complain i mean so we it's are, not sunk exactly. which is it is what it is i mean it yeah, is what it is exactly this is the reality i mean would we would, would i rather bear the cost and uh, or as opposed to just you know do the opposite of course i would bear the cost exactly. so to that extent it's fine Wonderful. So, Rajeshwari, Shraina, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been such a great conversation. It should have gone on for five hours more, but okay, we'll make do this time, and uh, you will come back again. Hundred percent. Thank you so much for inviting us back. Amit. Thank you so much, Amit, and it was a pleasure knowing Shraina as well in this podcast. So yes. I think we basically just just ended up having a good adda, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Except that before this, you were bong explaining her name to me and saying Amit is not Shraina, it's Shroyana, and then I she came and said it's Shroyana. Yes, I've been proved wrong, and on that note. It was a magical time being here with Rajesh Shree. Thank, Thank you. you so much. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, check out the show notes for many more rabbit holes. You can follow Shreyana on Twitter at b Shreyana. You can follow Rajeshwari on Twitter not because she's not on social media, which is why she is so productive and gets so much work done. You can follow me on Twitter though because I'm not quite as productive at Amit Varma A M I T V A R M A. You can browse past episodes of the Seen and the Unseen at SeenUnseen dot i n. Thank you for listening. Did you enjoy this episode of The Scene and the Unseen? If so, would you like to support the production of the show? You can go over to sceneunseen.in/support and contribute any amount you like to keep this podcast alive and kicking. Thank you.